Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Good morning, everybody. Uh, so it's time to start again. Uh, so I'll just introduce people Mark and Mark the Nation. Yes. Thanks, Alex. All right. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. So yeah, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for pulling this uh, wonderful workshop together on such a short notice. Higher, even higher. Uh, and of course, I'm grateful for the opportunity to share our work with you. Uh, so the subject of my talk today is going to be my Iran Affirmians. And uh, so as you know, I mean, that's actually something that has been exciting and has attracted attention of uh, uh, condensed matter theorists and experimentalists for about 20 years now. And uh, so there are varied reasons. So one of the reasons perhaps is that, uh, so Myrana Fermian seems to be like uh, sort of uh, tantalizingly within reach. Uh, and it is a non-abelian quasiparticle. So I mean, if we could realize that in solid state, that would be extremely exciting. Uh, so another sort of a corollary of that is that uh, uh, this is something that uh, could in fact lead by at least uh, aid in helping, aid in building a topological quantum computer. So that's uh, uh, another part of the attraction. Uh, but uh, uh, as you know, uh, in most of the cases, the, the treatment of Majorana Fermi's, the theoretical treatment of Majorana Fermi's starts with mean field theory. And you may wonder, okay, so is it really uh, good enough, robust enough in order to be able to predict uh, properties of something as, as small as a single closer particle? And uh, particularly for small superconductors where, you know, that's, uh, let's say, an you know, isolated superconductor, which has fixed number of particles, uh, you should be a little bit suspicious because uh, BCS mean field theory, uh, basically the BCS wave function is a superposition over uh, many numbers of particles. Uh, so, so it seems like it's a bit of a subtle, subtle issue. And uh, in this presentation, I would like to sort of show you what uh, sort of big tack that we've taken on the problem. and. Uh, so what we what we conclude about the uh, robustness of Majorana's and uh, sort of the effects of going beyond mean field. Uh, so first of all, let me acknowledge my collaborators. <clears throat> so they are uh, uh, Rohit Sajid, who uh, when we did most of uh, most of this work, he was undergrad at Berkeley, and now he moved into grad school at Harvard. And uh, my longtime collaborator, uh, Kartik Agarwal, who uh, just recently moved from McGill University to Argon. So, so here's the outline. Uh, first, I'm going to give you a bit of a background on Majorana Fermions, what they are, why they're exciting, what is the uh, sort of incomplete experimental status on the search, on the hunt for Majoranas. Uh, so then uh, we're going to look at the uh, sort of approaches to, to understand Majorana Fermions beyond mean field. And uh, so mentioned some of the approaches, not all of the approaches to the problem. And uh, so then for the rest of the talk, we're gonna deal with a particular way to, uh, to look at the problem solely focusing on the, uh, on the wave function, but not the BCS wave function, but something which is supposed to approximate better uh, a number conserving system. So which will be a projected uh, BCS wave function. And what I'm gonna show you is that uh, <clears throat> Uh, even that wave function uh, basically retains quite a few properties that we associate with <clears throat> with Majoranas. Uh, so in particular, we'll be able to build a an operator which uh, looks uh, very similar but different to Majorana operator. Uh, we'll address the uh, uh, in in passing at least the problem of tunneling. So because there is like a sort of smoking gun uh, of Majorana fermions. Uh, that you expect in the tunneling experiments where the tunnel conductance should be quantized to a particular value. Uh, and then how one can address braiding in the, again, in the number conserving setting. So the goals of this uh, presentation of this work more generally uh, is twofold. So one is to demystify Majorana's, uh, sort of try to understand in the uh, many body language, in the many particle language, what they are. And uh, the second is to examine potential weaknesses of the mean field treatment. So should we, or can we rely on the mean field or, or there are some, some subtleties. 
So, so this is perhaps the simplest setting <clears throat> in which myelin filaments uh, occur, at least uh, one of the first I'll be were sort of uh, introduced into the field in condensed matter. So suppose we take a two-dimensional uh, E-wave superconductor, and uh, in contrast to the standard S-wave superconductor where we have the, the amplitude of the water parameter and the phase, so now we have also this uh, sort of vectorial nature uh, of the water parameter. And as a result, the topological excitations in the superconductor can be different than the usual, than the standard uh, S-wave vortices. So in particular, like if we pick a point and we go around it, uh, we can wind the phase by angle pi and we can sort of add this extra sort of missing pi by uh, rotating this uh, vector d in the order parameter uh, from d to minus d. So it's a legitimate vortex. The order parameter uh, remains uh, single valued as I go around the uh, around this point, but it turns out that the properties of this vortex are actually rather different from the standard one. So in the usual vortices in the S-wave superconductors, we have the uh, intragap states called uh, Dijan Caroli matricon states. So here we also get those states, but uh, but there is a uh, one very special state which is sitting exactly in the middle of the gap at zero energy. And uh, so if you look at the Bogolub of quasi particle, which corresponds to the state, it is self conjugate. So so in this sense, you could say it's uh, it's real. So in fact, if I square this uh, operator, I, I end up with one. So these are fermions, but they, they look like uh, rather unusual fermions. They're fermions in the sense that if I commute, I would say this operator with that operator, I mean, they anti-commute as they should, but uh, but they square to one instead of uh, zero. Uh, to build a canonical fermion, uh, we can take two of these guys uh, in a linear combination <clears throat> as real and imaginary part. And uh, so this fermion then you can think of as a like real, well, real in the sense a uh, Dirac uh, fermion, which uh, uh, which can be either occupied or empty, it's sitting again at zero energy. So in fact, it encodes the degeneracy of the ground state. So if I have two uh, two Majoranas, that corresponds to a uh, ground state degeneracy of two. And uh, so in fact, you can label the ground states uh, by the occupation number of those fermions. But one should keep in mind that these are sort of constructed, sort of synthetic fermions. They're not really sort of uh, they're not real electric. Uh, and in fact, part of the issue is like how you how you relate these fermions to, to like the physical fermions to, <clears throat> uh, or these ends to the actual sort of number of uh, electrons that occupy your state. Uh, all right. Okay. So 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 why uh, it has been quite exciting uh, is uh, because if you now imagine having sort of multiple pairs of myron, so so if we look so far in the previous slide, kind of like at this picture. Uh, if we have a bunch of them, like six in this case, and we start sort of dragging them uh, around each other, uh, it turns out that we can start uh, implementing non-trivial transformations in this uh, uh, multiply degenerate ground state manifold. And uh, so even though that doesn't represent a complete set of operations that you need in order to, to build a quantum computer, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's pretty good. Plus, uh, uh, it's, uh, it has been argued that this is topologically protected. That uh, essentially doesn't matter too much how precisely you do those operations, as long as you do them slowly enough, uh, but not too slow for the experts, uh, uh, you, you can implement uh, uh, well-defined uh, transformations in the ground state manifold, uh, as shown here. So uh, so the search for uh, for the Majorans was, uh, was on. So people started thinking about different ways to implement them. Uh, probably the, the first proposal, sort of realistic proposal, was uh, uh, done by Fu and Kane, where they uh, proposed to take a topological insulator coated with a uh, S-wave superconductor, and uh, that should generate a uh, topological superconductor at the interface. Uh, but then subsequently, fairly soon, it was realized that, in fact, you don't even necessarily need a topological insulator. You can take a uh, usual semiconductor with spin-orbit interaction coated with a uh, with a superconductor, again, as wave superconductor, and, and this uh, uh, one dimensional system effectively becomes a, uh, a P wave superconductor. So, uh, upon application of uh, appropriately sized magnetic field. So, in fact, yeah, there, there were like two proposals roughly at the same time. <clears throat> and that sounded uh, fairly realistic. So, so, experimentalists immediately jumped upon it. Okay, so before I go there, 
so you may ask, okay, so I have 1D systems, uh, but, uh, but it seems like braiding is kind of important, right? So how do I do braiding with 1D systems? And uh, uh, it was very soon realized that, in fact, yes, by going a little bit away from, from 1D, by allowing this kind of like T-junction architecture, you can also do the braiding. So you can have this kind of like uh, multiple uh, wires uh, with my runs at the ends, and by sort of uh, allowing the wires to sort of to go sideways a little bit, you can also implement exchanges of my runs. So, so one D is not really a limitation, <clears throat> at least in principle. So, uh, yeah. So the hunt was on, and uh, in fact, soon thereafter, uh, there was experiment from Leo Kovenholm's group where they did precisely that. They took a semiconducting wire, they coated it with a superconductor. Uh, and they looked for the uh, signatures of Majorana uh, states, which should show up as uh, zero energy states uh, sort of in the middle of the gap. Uh, and indeed, when they did the tunneling spectroscopy, they they saw some features at zero energy, which uh, uh, they proposed could correspond to Majorana states. Uh, but, but there was sort of a, a snag that uh, the intensity of these peaks uh, differed from what you would expect from the mean field theory. So in mean field theory, uh, you would expect that the peak in the conductance should reach uh, to e squared over h. Here, it was quite a bit smaller, maybe like a factor of five smaller. Uh, so, so even though it was uh, sort of tantalizing, uh, it wasn't quite conclusive. And uh, uh, it took a few more years uh, <clears throat> to, to claim that in, indeed the system was sufficiently under control that uh, uh, you could sort of deterministically make the Majorana fermions and you could see conductance of uh, two squared over H. So that's the experiment. This is, uh, this is theory. Uh, but it turned out that to be, even there, the story was more complicated that some of the data wasn't shown. Uh, so in fact, in many cases, the system didn't behave as you, as you would expect. And uh, that paper as a result uh, had, to be, had to be retracted. So is it surprising? Not, not really, because I mean, it is, it is a very difficult experiment. You have to sort of create a good uh, contact, uh, create good proximity between superconductor and semiconductor, and it's bound to have some inhomogeneity. So, so even if you have Majorana here, you may have like a bunch of other Majoranas somewhere in between. So, so it's, it's difficult. So, uh, but, but uh, the other question it tries it raises is uh, perhaps uh, okay, maybe the, the difficulty is not only technical. So, so maybe there is something else that we're missing because we were kind of like quick to accept that, yes, we can do mean field theory. We get uh, those uh, very special uh, big of closer particles in the vortex cores or at the edges of the uh, 1D wires. But is that really the, the full story? Uh, can, something, can something go wrong? And in particular, as I mentioned, if I have an uh, isolated wire, uh, I mean, I, I don't really expect the mean field theory to apply sort of in the literal sense because I'm not allowing the uh, charge to fluctuate <clears throat> unless there's some some bigger superconductor that it can uh, connect to. So 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 let let's think about that. Um, uh, how do we go beyond mean field? And uh, so also just as par partial motivation inspiration. Uh, so if you don't trust me, that's uh, it's something worth worrying about. Uh, so Tony Leggett was the probably the first person who uh, started hitting a point on this point that uh, we should really sort of think about DCS not as sort of as the as the ground truth, but uh, but one should really think about deviations from from DCS. And uh, like for instance, this one of his papers with uh, Lin, uh, where he basically says that yeah, if the number of particles is con is conserved. Uh, there could be some issues that uh, could lead potentially to uh, deviations from simple mean field and therefore can make the whole sort of logical quantum computing uh, a little bit uh, uh, suspect <clears throat> that it may not really work quite well as we would like it to. Ivar? Yes. When you talk about deviations from mean field, you mean deviation of stronger couplings or deviations already at weak coupling as something fundamental? Uh, yeah, even at weak coupling, yeah, yeah. So, so, uh, so, so the mean field basically, like, even if you do weak coupling, uh, implies that you're, well, I mean, the BCS wave function is superposition of uh, over different number states, at least different uh, uh, number of pair states, and 
So this is something that we kind of take for granted and uh, we say, okay, in big enough system, who cares? I mean, would I have like uh, uh, n particles or n particles plus square root of n? But if I'm uh, talking about a finite system, uh, that's already less less clear, right? Because it's like, I mean, first of all, your n is small. So like one over n effect may not be tiny. Plus here we, we are thinking about uh, individual quasi particle. So which is again, which is inherently uh, n equal to one. So so yeah, that's that's the thing which uh, I think is inherently there is fundamentally kind of complicated uh, within BCS. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let me highlight a couple of ways uh, uh, that people proposed uh, to deal with this problem at different levels. Uh, so Tony specifically he said that okay, so if we are dealing with a charge conserving system, the least you can do. Uh, uh, you should keep track of uh, number of electrons. So for instance, when you construct a Bogolubo quasi particle, you shouldn't be just taking a superposition of a particle operator and uh, an antiparticle operator, but you should also keep track of the Kluge pairs. And as a result, if you do some sort of manipulation uh, of, uh, uh, of these uh, quasi particles, including Majorana fermions, uh, you should also see what's going on with your Kluge pair operator, because that's also gonna contribute to the transformation. Uh, okay, so uh, another way uh, which sort of digs even sort of uh, takes uh, one step back uh, is to ask, uh, okay, so can we uh, construct a realistic model of a topological uh, superconductor in 1D and uh, uh, again, without relying on mean cold? And this is what uh, uh, what these guys did, uh, uh, here are their season collaborators. Uh, they constructed a model, which is interacting model. Uh, uh, it's of this Richardson Ganon type. <clears throat> uh, and uh, so this this model actually allows uh, it's integrable, so it allows uh, solution at least on a uh, on a closed geometry like with periodic boundary conditions, antiperiodic generalized boundary conditions. Uh, they can solve the spectrum and uh, at least they can check that uh, uh, the the spectrum behaves as you would expect under changes of periodic uh, of the of the boundary conditions as you would expect from a topological superconductor. Uh, but this doesn't directly address the question of Majoranas because, again, we are not looking at system with the edges. Uh, and uh, so uh, the other approach, which uh, I thought was kind of interesting, is uh, you can kind of like flip the problem around. You can ask, okay, so I know that uh, the Kataif wave function, uh, uh, which is, I'm going to show you in a second, uh, which encodes a topological superconductor, uh, is a good wave function. Uh, can I find a parent Hamiltonian for which a Kataev wave function would be uh, would be the ground state? But the Hamiltonian should be like true interactive Hamiltonian. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Exactly. Yes. So what is this SK? Uh, I mean, K belongs to just just out of curiosity. Is it model? Uh, yeah. SK oh belongs, yeah. yes, yes, yes. So so this is basically some some conditions on the yeah I forget actually precisely. Uh, okay, so so phi is the uh, I believe is the uh, twist on the boundary conditions. I see. And uh, so this is how you pick your K. So it's basically a discrete set. I mean, it's not a continuum. And, uh, right, because I think it, it, it matters which, which boundary conditions you. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And and in fact, yeah, so so the way uh, the spectrum of the system responds to oh. boundary conditions is precisely how they said that, okay, this, okay. Is, this looks like a topological surrogate. Uh -huh. yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, so, so what these guys were able to do uh, uh, Sebastian Deal's group and Caden Hazard's group uh, is to build up Hamiltonians, which are true interacting Hamiltonians, like of this kind, uh, where Kitai uh, wave function would be uh, would be the eigenstate. In fact, would be a ground state. Uh, but since these Hamiltonians conserve number of particles, they actually uh, like every sort of number sector of Kitai wave function would be uh, the ground state as well. Uh, okay, so so what what is this mysterious uh, Kitai wave function? Uh, it comes from looking at the following Hamiltonian. So that's the famous uh, Kitaev's Hamiltonian. We have hopping, we have uh, pair hopping, well, or rather we have a uh, pairing uh, term. And uh, so it's a quadratic Hamiltonian, so we can diagonalize it. Uh, uh, but it turns out that if I write it out uh, uh, in full many body by constructing slated determinants of the uh, big loop station, it will actually look in a very nice, uh, uh, particularly nice uh, form uh, at this uh, sweet spot point where the hopping is the same as delta and chemical potential is equal to zero. Uh, so it's literally, 
uh, superposition of the states where we either create or do not create a particle on every side of the chain. So those ends can be either zeros or ones. So essentially each term in, this, uh, in the sum is coded by, by a bit string. And the Kitaev wave function is just sum over all the, all the bit strings with equal weights. Uh, now, <clears throat> uh, of course, this is, a, again, it's a superposition of different number states. Uh, so as Tony Leggett actually has argued, uh, projecting a BCS wave function to a fixed number state uh, actually is supposed to give you a quite a good uh, variational, uh, 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 variational wave function. So this is what we can, and so, so as such, it should retain uh, uh, essential properties of, uh, uh, of the BCS wave function and of superconductivity. So let's, let's do precisely that. So from all these uh, terms, let's pick out terms which have fixed number of particles. So now instead of saying that we can either be in, in the even or odd sector, uh, let's uh, basically fix the total number of particles. And again, there will be a tons of uh, bit strings, in fact, precisely that many. Uh, but now this wave function is going to have fixed charge. And uh, so as I, as I mentioned on the previous slide, this wave function will be, in fact, uh, a ground state in a particular number sector of this Hamiltonian. So, so what we have done here, we ex expanded to the degeneracy uh, by quite a bit. So we used to have degeneracy between uh, even and odd uh, in the sort of mean field type. So now we have basically uh, extensive degeneracy. All the states with different number of particles, different numbers of particles, uh, would have the same energy and would be the ground states of uh, this Hamiltonian. Now, uh, so this wave function, I mean, certainly not your canonical BCS, uh, but nevertheless, it has uh, some, some very special uh, properties which uh, uh, we typically associate with Majoranus. Uh, in particular, you can show uh, very easily by inspection that it's very easy to create a particle at the edge uh, and it will have uh, basically one more particle, but it will have uh, order one overlap with the ground state with n plus one particles. Uh, so in this sense, uh, at zero energy cost, because both of these are ground states at zero energy, uh, I can create particle at the, at the edge. Uh, on the other hand, if I want to create a particle sort of in the bulk somewhere, even one step away from the edge, uh, I'm going to get some suppression because, because of fermionic anti-commutation. Okay, so, so it's as if we, we really have a situation where there is like a bulk gap for single particle stations, but, uh, but at the edges, it's free. Uh, so we don't need this uh, huge macroscopic superposition in order to, uh, to uh, of different number states in order to get this physics. Uh, so also, uh, we can construct a cool pair operator, something which takes me between uh, ground states of the same parity, but with number of, numbers of particles uh, different by two. Uh, and this operator, in fact, is also quite simple. So it's basically creation of pairs of operators, uh, pairs of fermions on the adjacent sites. And uh, in this case, clearly, there is no uh, fermion sign that comes into the consideration. So when I do that, uh, I end up again with superposition of bit strings, which has good overlap. In fact, you can show it's uh, overlap one uh, with the state with n plus two number of particles. Okay. So in the, yes. the previous part, it seemed like the feeling was one half. Yes, exactly. But now you're saying that you can construct ground states with any yeah, yeah. So, so here, yeah, very, very nice, Cynthia. Uh, so, so here, uh, indeed, I get zero only uh, if it's one half. Uh, but I can also pick a different number sector where I'm not uh, at, let's say, n equal to the size of the system over two, but a different filling. And in this case, uh, it's not going to be precisely zero. There will be a suppression, sort of, uh, again, very similar to my runs. There will be exponential suppression uh, of the matrix element to create a particle in the bulk, but it's going to be a finite decay. Uh, so uh, here it turns out that this operator actually works uh, uh, for any filling. And it can take uh, any n, uh, any ratio of n to l, and uh, it still still works. In fact, there, there are more uh, operators that behave this way, curiously enough. Yes? So this uh, Hamiltonian for which this mm -hmm. number of conserving wave function in the general state, yes. that Hamiltonian is not local real space. Uh, no, why? Is this local? Here. So it's hopping and it's interaction, attraction between nearest neighbors. 
So, uh, but let me ask you that uh, in a one D system with a short range interaction, yeah, generically we expect with a with a single flavor, like yes. single spin spin polarized. Right. Uh, one expect that once it generates a picture liquid, which is gaseous. Correct. So, so Correct. the the, um, the Compressibility of this thing is zero, right? That's uh, kind of its sort of compressibility is finite, right? So essentially, you, you don't have a gap. So yeah, it's precisely right. No, yeah. But, but all the number <laughs> states on uh, a uh, finite system, all the round states with different numbers are generated. Yes. So that means that the compressibility is zero. The state. Uh, compressibility is infinite. Infinite, infinite yes. Uh, infinite. Right. Infinite. right. It's it's infinite on one hand, but uh, but yes. Uh, and nevertheless, if I try to put a particle, uh, you know, somewhere in the bulk, right, I'm going to have a problem. So uh, it's infinite because of the fact that uh, it's easy for me to put particles at the at the edges. So so it has this. Uh, the, in this way, yes, it has some funny non-locality about it, but. Uh, uh, but yeah, there are different sort of uh, parts to it. So one is uh, there is this macroscopic degeneracy of the ground state, uh, and the other is that uh, in fact the spectrum uh, of this problem is gapless even beyond the ground state manifold. So in a in a finite system, the gap actually goes as uh, for this particular choice of parameters goes as one over L squared. Uh, so so yeah, it's it's finite in a finite system, but uh, but disappears uh, in the yeah. yes. If you use long range interaction. That's right. That's right. So, and and in fact, like uh, in this uh, paper, Ortiz and company, uh, they did have longer range interaction, and so you could have like a solid gap. So, uh, but that would, I mean, dealing with uh, th these sorts of problems, of course, is more complicated. So you would have to probably do some stuff numerically. So there's certainly stuff <laughs> that remains to be done. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, uh, okay. So so now, <clears throat> yeah, moving kind of slow, but uh, uh, but it's fine. Uh, so we can construct also Majorana operators, right? So the usual Majorana operators, uh, we think of them as superposition of uh, particle and hole, but, uh, but here we really want to do something similar, but under conditions of number conservation. So just to remind you, the usual Majorana operators, they flip between even and odd parity states in both directions. Uh, so here, since we want to conserve charge, uh, the best we can hope for is an operator that flips me between uh, n and n plus one, which is again different parity states, but also in fact they're just different n states. Uh, and uh, there's some other nice properties uh, that we expect this operator to have, namely if I uh, destroy and create the Majorana, uh, I go back to the same state, or if I create uh, two uh, Majorana, so to speak, then I'm going to go uh, to another ground state with sort of extra glue there added. So it turns out that this is this is possible, this is doable. <clears throat> And the operators, they look like this. So indeed, uh, they look just like the your uh, normal uh, Majorana operators, but they're decorated by the Kuhver operator. Uh, so it works. Uh, they exist at both ends. They anti-commute. Uh, again, they're not like, as you see, uh, they're not simple uh, linear fermionic operators. Like this guy is a cubic uh, in fermions. But nevertheless, if I restrict to the ground state manifold, uh, they behave just like uh, normal fermions. Uh, okay, and uh, so yeah, th this precisely at half filling. Otherwise, it gets modified a bit, uh, but it is very consistent with what Tony Leggett proposed uh, for for his definition of my Uh Now, does it uh, solve our problems with, uh, say, tunneling? Would it give us like an easy way out? Uh, it turns out that uh, uh, that by itself uh, does not. So, uh, so even with this sort of projected treatment, so we still expect to get. Uh, uh, like e squared, two e squared over h uh, tunneling conductance at uh, at zero bias. So that's still uh, still a problem. Sorry, so, uh, yes. uh, I thought you kind of talking about finite size systems, so I'm not even sure how to define. <laughs> well, just like uh, in the usual case when you do tunneling, you just uh, shouldn't wait for too long, right? Uh, for like too much of charge to flow. Just formula, or uh, yeah, yeah, you can do Kubo form. I mean, you can go sort of. Uh, uh, Beyond Kubo formula, but but yeah, you uh, essentially say that you have a wire, and then you have a contact, which is like a usual, uh, you know, metallic contact, uh, and you compute the the tunneling conductance the same way as you would, but only focusing. So here, uh, the Hamiltonian that I write is only in the ground state manifold, but that's what I need in order to uh, to see what's going to happen close to zero energies, and there is a direct mapping between uh, 
what you had previously in the mean fields if you did it in the mean field way and uh, and this number projected way. So I, I can explain in a bit more detail later, but. Uh, Is there uh, any difference? So unfortunately, we were hoping, but that doesn't doesn't seem to be. Formally, I don't see much difference in the population. Uh, yeah, I mean, there, there, there's like one subtle point there, but uh, but okay. So, so one way to see uh, what's going on is that uh, so you have your uh, let's say you're creating Fermi in, in the uh, in the lead, right? And this is what's happening in the ground states. You go from the ground states with n plus one particles to n. Uh, so, and you basically sum over all the uh, all the n's, right? Uh, so I can replace this sort of operator. Yeah, yeah, like we yeah. go into the phase basis, and then exactly. the stuff just traces off. Yeah. Yeah. So, so unfortunately, yeah, there, there is no sort of easy score there. Uh, <clears throat> but we we can expect that something uh, something different would would happen in braiding because braiding does right does rely on the uh, uh, on the on the phases. So it's kind of hard to imagine braiding without phases. So if it can take like two two minutes three minutes to just wrap this up. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and again, so it turns out that just by looking at the wave function, we can get already quite a bit of mileage. So, uh, so there is a dictionary you can establish between the uh, mean field uh, situation and this let's call it uh, many body situation, by which I simply mean number projected wave functions. Uh, so the wave functions in one case are those sums over either uh, uh, even or odd numbers of particles. Here we're restricting to a particular number of particles. Uh, and now, sort of, to set up the braiding, what I need to do, I need to uh, to have at least four Majorana, so I need to split this wire by by weak link. So I introduce a weak link between sites uh, L and L plus one. In the Majorana case, I know what's going to happen. Uh, I'm going to create uh, uh, another pair of uh, Majoranas uh, over here with the parity given uh, by the vacuum parity one. Uh, but now in the in the many body case, uh, what happens is that now in every wire I can have a fixed number of particles. Like uh, so, if I start with n total, it's going to be n one here and n minus n one in the other one. So this is going to be my states. That's how I'm going to label them. Uh, but now the tunneling will allow me to transfer individual uh, fermions. So I end up with this uh, uh, type of in the low energy sector. I end up with this uh, tunneling Hamiltonian, which is rather different from what I get from the from the Majoranas. Uh, uh, so, so I can think of the wave function in this case. Uh, and uh, the wave function is going to be uh, now a superposition, but not superposition like of total number states. It's going to be superposition of uh, states with different numbers of particles, say, in the left uh, subwire. And uh, so, OK, so you can sort of guess for positive t how the solution will look like. It will be uh, some superposition peaked at a certain value of n. Uh, the energy is going to be given basically by the strongest hopping. So that's where the system will want to, to sit. Uh, I can also construct anti-ground state. Uh, and the anti-ground state uh, is just different by the sort of uh, alternating sign, sign changes. So it's like, if this is a zero phase, this is like a pi phase uh, between the adjacent amplitudes, the energy is going to be sort of at the other side of the spectrum. Uh, and indeed, you can identify just by tracking how these... Uh, Energies change, say, with the strength, the strength of uh, tunneling with the Majorana situation. So this state will correspond to the even parity of Majoranas, and this state will correspond to the uh, odd parity of Majoranas. And uh, so you can sort of think of these as your junction basis. Like if I if I create two wires, I can either be in the ground state or sort of anti-ground state. So just like with the Majoranas. I mean, there are a bunch of other states that one should be aware of, but uh, but these these are two special ones. Uh, one can also construct a, uh, a wire parity basis uh, and just as linear superpositions. And you'll see that uh, uh, in one case, it will be uh, even superposition, and in the other case, it's going to be odd superposition. So yes, I'm, I'm really uh, sort of out of time. So let me just quickly uh, sort of show this as a cartoon and more and uh, sort of address it in the, <laughs> perhaps in the, question answer section. So the uh, so the the main thing with the sort of my around braiding is that you can basically affect the parities. And uh, so you can basically trace uh, what's going on here. You can create positive particles if you do a certain number of braidings. And uh, the trick is that you don't necessarily need to do it geometrically. You can also do it by Hamiltonians. And this is what we've done. We've showed that 
uh, by introducing tunneling Hamiltonian, I can basically reproduce these sort of transformations uh, between these states, so like uh, junction parity states or wire parity states that I showed you before. Uh, okay, so with geometry, it's a bit more subtle, uh, like just rotation in one dimensional systems doesn't do much. So you have to use some extra tricks in order to implement braiding uh, there. So again, uh, if somebody's interested, I'll be happy to discuss it either in the questions or offline. But let me just uh, jump to the uh, to the summary to conclusions. So we can get quite a bit of mileage just by looking at the wave function. Uh, and uh, so we can learn about tunneling. We can uh, understand a little bit braiding. We can understand also uh, uh, that the <clears throat> braiding is a bit fragile. It's it's uh, perhaps it's doable, but it's not really as stable as you would get. From the from the mean field, and uh, there there are like lots of directions one can take it in the future, and uh, one of them is to really look at the Hamiltonian set, the energetics of the problem, uh, and indeed, uh, like Liang mentioned, uh, sort of the the role of spectral gaplessness that's that's also important. Uh, so there's quite a bit more stuff to do, but but uh, but looks interesting, and I think we're getting sort of closer to understanding what Majoranas are. Thank you. Yes, Dima. When you reduce this um, um, problem to, to the hopping problem in the number space, so to speak, do you make an assumption uh, about the uh, relative strength of charging energy on one of the islands and uh, gap? Right, right. So, so here I didn't include charging at all, uh, uh, but uh, but indeed, if you uh, if you put it back in, uh, you'll see that uh, it does affect the wave functions uh, uh, in, in a fairly non trivial way. So, for instance, uh, if I say that, okay, so I start with a single wire, I try to split it adiabatically into two. For any non zero charging energy, uh, basically, I'm going to end up with a well defined number of particles, uh, like in one lead versus the other, right? Because the only thing which uh, sort of messes up is tunneling. But if tunneling is center zero, then Adiposity is going to force me into fixed number states. So, so as soon as you have charging energy, you'll have to break adiabaticity. And that's sort of one of the reasons that this sort of setup is going to be sort of inherently decoherent, so to speak. Yeah. There's a known analogy between a conventional dive chain and the, the Eisen spin chain. So in your case, you're considering, uh, is it the, the analogy is exactly the same or something gets modified because you consider those um, basically composed wave functions? Um, right. Uh, yeah, no, that, that's that's an interesting question. Uh, so because, yeah, they correspond between the Kataev chain and the, uh, and the, uh, Right, and the Ising chain is that uh, essentially your uh, Kitaev states, they correspond to sort of superposition of all ups and all downs, right? Uh, so yeah, you can ask like, what will be the sort of corresponding magnetic states? Let's say if I take a projected Kitaev wave function, so what that would be in the uh, in the spin language. Actually, and I, I, I don't know, I don't know, because the, the projection transformation is really violent, right? So you, you're going from slated determinant to something totally different. Uh, so how that would affect the mapping uh, would have to think. I, I would think it's like a priori that's something like totally, totally bizarre, but I'm not sure. Questions? <clears throat> yes, yes. I have a question regarding the calculation of the tunnel and conductance through the zero mole. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have an estimate of the time Electron spans within this state and the corresponding uncertainty of energy. Is it small? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, maybe we can discuss it. I'm not sure okay. I understand the question. Well. Yeah. So I thought you, from the beginning, your, your task was to try to make connection to realistic finite systems uh, that experimentalists like myself uh, look at. And can you summarize your conclusions? It seems like nothing has changed from the mean field calculation. Yeah, yeah. So, so I would say that uh, actually, yeah, quite a bit uh, is different. So at the level of- Do it specifically? Yeah, exactly. So 
so at the level of the tunneling properties, so like spectral properties, so say uh, if I take a finite wire and I start tunneling into the edge, will it look different? Not, not really, it's not gonna look very different. So like single particle properties are essentially the same. But uh, yeah, if we're thinking about sort of more, uh, you know, elaborate things like braiding, yeah, there that, that's where basically a lot of differences emerge because uh, in the in the mean field, we just have two parity states. That's it. You have basically double degeneracy for two Majoranas, or well, accessible zero for two Majoranas, or four Majoranas. You have double degeneracy. You can start to play with. Uh, so it's it's very very discrete. If I look at this kind of, uh, one could argue more realistic picture of superconductor, the degeneracy is much higher. So basically, all number states are degenerate. Okay, and as a result, you have much bigger manifolds uh, of degenerate brown states within which you can have many more transformations and therefore they're not as sort of digital uh, as they would be in the in the mean field. So, and, and that sort of discreteness comes out, uh, comes about from, if you think about it, from stabilizing the phase of those wires by a bigger superconductor. But I'm kind of like uneasy about this because like where you draw the line uh, of your system. So it's, 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 it's subtle. Right. Um, our next topic by Rachel Cuerras from Columbia, uh, quantum geometry of capacity. <laughs> Look at this in the title this time. Yes. Um, okay, thank you so much, uh, the organizers, for having me here, giving me an opportunity to tell you about something that excites me a lot, which is talking about old concepts in physics in a modern language and hopefully demystify the modern language, this quantum geometry stuff and uh, teach me a little bit more about some, um, it's too, it's too little, Maybe. like that. Uh, teach me some, something that I didn't know about linear response. So that is, that is quite exciting. And in view of, oh, no, this, this, okay. Of being introductory, um, we can start by thinking about polarization, electric polarization in solids in, um, periodic systems. And this has been a problem until the 90s. It was a problem how you actually uh, properly define uh, electric polarization. And the reason is if you just apply by simply the dipole moment that you know from molecules, which has the position operator and the charge density, you'll see that this is not really well defined in a periodic system because periodic system is infinite. This is an unbounded operator. Um, and more than that, and I stole these pictures from David Vanderbilt's book, you can choose whatever unit cell you want. So if you choose this unit cell and you compute the, dip the total dipole moment, you'll get zero because the electric charge is around, negative charges are surrounding the positive charge. But if you were to just choose a different unit cell, you'll get a different answer and you can get basically any answer you want. Um, and this is really like a fundamental insight that King Smith and Vanderbilt had which is it's impossible, even in principle, to define the um, uh, uh, charge polarization in terms of the charge density alone. You really care about wave function uh, phases. So the solution was to rewrite all of this in terms of uh, cell periodic block states use, and then just write the position operator as a derivative with respect to the crystal momentum. And now we write polarization. This is of course not exactly the same as the, the, the uh, expression before, but it's, uh, it has some similarities. But then you, what you have here is the very connection and you are integrating over the Brillouin zone. And you know that in 1D, this is just a Berry phase that you are integrating, a Berry-Zach phase. 
Um, and this has been, you know, we've been uh, now very accustomed to think about these things and very phases basically tell you where the charge centers of charges are in there's a consistent way to tell you where the center of charges is within the unit cell. Um, and symmetry can, you know, pin this to certain points, so it can be quantized in some cases. Uh, so if the we will usually say that if the charge density is like bound to this to the original sites, these are trivial atomic insulators. I could, in principle, move them apart, and I will have no trouble doing that adiabatically. Uh, and in some other cases, the charge then the charge centers are kind of like off their original positions, but it's still in some high symmetry points, pinned by symmetry. And then, in these cases, we call this obstructed atomic limits, which was uh, introduced by Andre in uh, the topological quantum chemistry work. But we can have more problems than this, right? Uh, or maybe actually that me, another, the other way of thinking about this is actually the Merzari Vanderbilt way of thinking about this is looking at Vanya functions. So if you have a set of occupied states of occupied bands, uh, you can pick up all of these states and just rewrite it in new bases, the bases of localized orbitals, uh, which are orthogonal, but they are not gauge independent quantities. We can change their shapes. Uh, but their centers is R gauge independent because they're precisely given by uh, these periphases. Um, and if this is still slightly annoying to, to compute because it's a derivatives of wave functions, so it will care about their overall phase. Um, so the nicer way to write it is in terms of projector operators. So you can project write the projector operator onto the field states uh, either in terms of block states or Vani functions, it doesn't really matter. Then basically the position is nothing but the trace over the projector and the position operator. Okay. So sometimes uh, we have trouble doing that in all dimension, in all directions, because we have topological obstruction. So on all levels, we will have a, a topological obstruction, topological insulators, certain insulators, and so on. Uh, and the reason is if you try to localize in one direction, let's say that I try to localize in the X and then I just keep Y free and I just look at the position in X and I change Y, I find that that position in X is actually changing continuously and crossing the entire unit cell. So it's like, it's very hard to, con you, you cannot consistently uh, really think about the, the, this, this states localized in real space. And the best way to understand it um, is in terms of just properties of Fourier transforms. So if I have something really boring, right? So where, where my block states are just completely flat, have no momentum structure whatsoever. If I Fourier transform this, I will get something which is perfectly uh, localized, like a delta function localized in real space, right? That will be my Banyan functions. If I have something which is smooth and periodic, then I will just have something Gaussian that decays exponentially. Um, but in some cases, when I have topological invariance, what I find is that if I want to get a smooth, uh, if I want to get a periodic and symmetric gauge, I will have to have some singularities which are irremovable. They don't really depend on the gauge I cho choose. And that will imply that my Vanya centers will decay algebraically. Okay. So this is an obst what we call this topological obstruction uh, to exponentially localized Vanya functions. Um, so it makes sense for us to think then if we care about like this extent of Vanya functions, it makes sense to be talking about not the first moment of the position operator, but the second moment of the position operator, the spread of this. Uh, and the spread of this, which is just basically written like that, that will not be totally gauge independent. We'll have a gauge independent part and a gauge dependent part, which will be important. But the gauge independent part is written here. Can be written very nicely in this in this uh, basis independent form, which is the projector into the onto the ground state position, projector into the empty states times position, and you can see that this tells you something about spread because imagine that in your ground state you have position eigenstates, right? So then it means that P and R would commute, then you would be projecting P times one minus P would be zero. So anything that deviates from that is basically what this is. This object is picking up. Um, and then this object here now is called the quantum geometric tensor. Now, the imaginary part and anti-symmetric part of this tensor is very familiar, which is just a very curvature. Uh, it tells you about the phases you gain when you evolve in momentum space your, your states. The, there's also a real anti-symmetric part of this operator, which is the quantum metric. 
Uh, this is all well defined like locally in momentum. It has a very ugly form and I don't prefer to write it in terms in, in, of real space. But one thing that you can understand, how you can understand these forms are basically Berry curvature here, which is the anti-symmetric part. So it's like X, Y. It's actually picking up on the anti-commutator of X and Y projected into the ground state. So while the anti-commutator, what is doing, X is like having a little shift in momentum, right? So it's the anti-commutator really makes a little loop in momentum that picks up a flux, the flux, and that will be the, the berry flux. Um, but also as you do that, you're going to lose a norm because you're going to project out, you're going, be, um, you're going to lose some norm and that, that uh, has actually been discussed uh, by Resta and Sorella very, fairly early, okay? So now what I want to do is to um, give you some kind of intuition of what these quantities are. So if you have, um, this is the Haldane model, changing the mass here from trivial to topological, and the, just look at the solid line. The solid line is the quantum metric, the trace of the quantum metric. So you see that if you are in the topological side, in the trivial side, you have relatively low quantum metric. It kind of diverges at, at the transition. And then the other side, it is larger and it seems to be bounded from below. And in fact, you can show that uh, the quantum metric, the trace of the quantum metric, the integral of the quantum metric over the Brillouin zone is always going to be bounded by topological invariance. Um, and this inequality can be saturated in some cases. So it can be exactly the same. And that happens for what we call ideal churn bands. Uh, well, first example, the most obvious example is just the Landau level, but the people have also been talking about um, ideal churn bands in for, for twisted systems. And uh, I did the, the chiral limit of twisted bilayer graphene, they will be also ideal churn bands. So quantum metric seems to like be a little bit obscure in terms of what uh, what actually means, but we see that it enters in certain situations, and um, it entered in this work of uh, Pai Vitorma, which really was really groundbreaking. She noticed that um, even if you are in a completely flat band, because quantum interference has you know, flatten, quench the kinetic energy of the flat band. If you look at Cooper pairs, so two particle excitations, those don't need to be flat and they will have some velocity, they will have some effective mass and also on, which means that you can have superfluidity. So you can have superconductivity in a flat band. And of course, if you have a, a total atomic limit, this wouldn't be possible. You might be pairing things on site, but they would not be able to really hop around. Um, and uh, so this means that if you were to look at the effective mass of the Cooper pairs, you find out, and that it's a very nice review of Pavey and Andre, um, where you basically can find some, define some effective mass, which is the interaction strength, which is really the only energy, energy scale you have in the problem, times the, the total metric. Okay, and that will give you uh, a notion of mass for the Cooper pairs. So what I want to talk about is uh, do we have like a kind of intuitive response way of thinking about the quantum metric? And I will tell you basically two limits, one where we're talking about non-dissipative response, so in insulators, low frequency response, where it is, there's no resonant transitions whatsoever, there's no resonance response, and also talk about dissipative response. So let me start by uh, the Kubo formula. Okay, so this is just the Kubo formula for conductivity. Everything will be included there. Um, and since we have insulators, we don't have a Fermi surface. All of the, the contribution to this thing is going to be coming from interband transitions. Um, so we'll rewrite it in this way. Here is just Fermi function. Um, here are the energy differences between the, the, the different uh, transitions. Here is basically the position operator, which rem rem I remind you that it's the Berry connection, right? So this, this uh, so here the phases, again, the phases are really important if we want to then couple to, to talk about polarization, to couple with electro electromagnetic fields. Um, and we have something here that will diverge when, when the, the frequency of the, of, the, of the applied field is in resonance with those transitions. 
So if we look here, okay, we have R squared. Is this anything to do with quantum geometry? That's the question. Well, let me write you here the quantum geometric tensor in the same basis. Uh, you know, field bands are N, empty bands are M. So these stars are N, R, M. So that's the way that I would write. But of course, this and this are very different. Okay, so there's no energies, there's no frequency dependence, there's nothing here. Do you assume that your bands are not degenerate? Uh, I didn't say anything about bands being degenerate or not degenerate. It doesn't really matter. Yeah, is it important for, for this? No, it's not important. Not so. This this all goes through. I can. You'll just no. Yeah. Um, but let's a bit understand what this thing is here. I can. It's basically uh, this Q, this this quantum geometric tensor is basically telling you some probabilities of of. Uh, having some virtual transitions of so the dipole let's think about the dipole operator like the off diagonal dipole operator p is the projector into these bands q is projection to this band so it takes you up and then takes you down uh, so again q is just written as p r q q is r p right that's that's exactly what the quantum geometric tensor is um, but we have here some frequency dependence so we do need to consider an electric field and when you put an electric field, things there will be time and the states will evolve. And therefore, these kind of virtual transitions can pick up phases associated with this, with the energy differences between the states. So let us just introduce a new object, uh, which is the time dependent quantum geometric tensor, uh, which is just basically the correlator between the dipole at two different times. And then I'll just write it in the in the same way, which is just um, the unoccupied states, occupied states, a phase associated with the energy differences times position. Now, this quantity here is really uh, giving you some information about like how many the, how these optical transitions are happening when you have an when you have a background electromagnetic. Now, this is still different from that. What, yeah. what, what are the brackets around the thing? What, what do they average? Trace. What? Just, tra just, just oh. trace. Just trace. Uh, okay, so it's not the same, but let's just go with it and let's just look at how this, this thing look like. Um, it's, first of all, it's non-emission. So if I dagger it, I will get the Q at minus T with a, a new and mu swapped. At time equals zero is exactly the quantum geometric tensor, okay? And it has some dependency time. You know, at, if you look here, you can read directly metric, uh, sorry, very curvature, uh, very curvature metric, but it has some time dependence. And it has kind of emission components, so the symmetric and the anti-symmetric parts with time, with respect to time. Uh, and if you look at the 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 one of them, the anti-symmetric parts, you'll see that this is just something that rotates between. Uh, metric and very curvature in some kind of periodic way. Very, very long period periodic way. So that's the, this is the punchline. Kubo formula can be written like this. So this is exactly the Kubo formula. It picks up because of causality, picks up the anti-symmetric part of this tensor. And it's just the time derivative this is a theta function. So again, t time is, 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 uh, is positive. Um, and here we have the, the time derivative of the time-dependent quantum geometric tensor. That's just cool for me. It's quite nice because if you blindly apply this even to metals, and then you just compute it, you find out that the, the time derivative of the quantum geometric tensor is shifted also by the Drude weight, so it's in there too. Okay, so this also is applying. It's possible to apply for metals, even though I didn't prove it here for you. I'm sorry to keep interrupting you, but uh, your initial expression for sigma contained this uh, diamagnetic piece and then the Kubo piece, right? Are, are they both included in this? Yeah, this everything work? is included in this. Everything is included. Uh, yes. This applies to a non packing system. Um, I didn't tell you which. Okay, so 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 if I, if you want to say that these are these energies here are your band energies, then yes, I would agree with you. But then in principle, I'm writing Q in a. If I write it in the projector form, right? This really just knows about the ground states and the empty states. So you could apply that for the many body states, which is which is actually one of the motivations. 
Uh, the time dependency is introduced in the, in the same way. We basically do uh, P R at the time T, Q R at the time T. Just, oh. <laughs> is it just rewriting of already existing formula, yes. right? Just rewrite. I'm just rewriting. But, it, but it's, it's, it's small, so I can remember. Is the existence of the gap important to the formula, or does it apply even to gap less? This is it applies to gap less. So is it, is it like, uh, if you, is it including the global the scattering back? That will, include, that will be part of the blue work. It will appear in the blue work. But uh, like in the definition of the Q, like on the geometry, it's quite interesting, right? So, so okay, yeah. So, so, so that needs to extend this. Uh, so in order to make this for metals to, um, wait, wait a second, where is it? I need mean, here. Okay, so this, this, uh, the Fermi functions here will, will have momentum dependence. I need to actually include that to contribute from R, which are not, like they K to K prime. It's a little more complicated. I, I'm not going to focus on that part, but there, there's a consistent way of doing it. Raquel? However, for the for the current, that's a non-interacting current, right? It's for I so I haven't so in principle what what so I, I just talking about the dipole dipole correlator for any I can write that for many body states. I need to think a little bit more about about how to extend this all the way. I haven't I haven't given it. Um, okay, but then we'll continue. Yeah. Yeah. It's not frequency, so we do we do have an indicator. Oh, what happened to my <laughs> <laughs> sorry oh, for that. <laughs> I guess I was heard even without the microphone. Um, okay, so so if you look at small frequencies, so before below the gap, and we don't have any states, uh, whatever we're going to get uh, is going to be non-dissipative response. And we can Fourier transform this and expand for small omega, small frequency, at that DC limit, what we're going to get, and it's going to come out very easily by just the fact that this is proportional to, to the quantum, the, that the quantum geometry enters here uh, in a very neat way, you get the TKNN formula, right? It's just that DC at omega, at first order, zeroth order in omega, you just get TKNN, so you get Hulk and activity. Um, at second order, you don't pick up the, the, the Berry curvature part, you pick up the metric part. Remember that this kind of swap. Uh, so you pick up the metric part. So this contribution to conductivity, this is like a capacitance. Uh, so this is, will be associated with the, with the electric susceptibility of of, uh, of your system. Yeah. Zero temperature. Zero temperature. Yeah. Uh, so this capacitance, if we write down explicitly, uh, you'll see that uh, coming from the, the the Fourier transform of that, you'll just pick up the same form, uh, uh, form uh, Fermi functions and G over omega over the energies. Now, if you take this omega out of the integral, which you can do by saying that every transition is larger than the gap, then you get basically the trace of the quantum metric over gap. So that will bound the, the, this capacitive response of the insulator. So in a sense, it's kind of nice to think about this, right? So you, there's no Fermi surface. So the only things that you have is really, you know, um, topology. So at zero frequency, this can only be a number, e square over h over number, and that number is a turn number. If you go to uh, AC, then you have a frequency, then you have to have metric over gap. Okay, so that will be the, what appears there. And this is uh, really the work of my student Helio, which is who is here somewhere. Uh, so look at let's look at some examples for the Haldane model. Is if you compute the capacitance. Uh, it will follow the, the the quantum metric curve. It will be a little bit more divergent because of the one over gap contribution. Um, if you look at twisted bilayer graphene, now assume that we put a little bit of a gap, we gap the bands by uh, HB, aligning with HBN. Uh, so we can compute the capacitance for that gap. And you can see that as you twi change the twist angle, uh, as you get to the magic angle, there's a huge dip in the in the capacitance 
So that will correspond. I can. There's many words for it. So the susceptibility or the dielectric constant. It will d dive down, and the reason is that this is very close to the magic angle. You have this trace condition where the metric is minimized. So you can see that uh, deep very clearly here. Um, so in the quantum Hall effect, it's also the trace condition also is satisfied. So the metric is going to be given by the churn number. Uh, so you can write. The, whole, the conductivity tensor for quantum Hall, uh, you have your typical uh, Hall conductivity part, but if you're looking at AC con uh, contribution, you have a diagonal AC contribution, which will be given by E square over H omega C times the churn number. And actually that doesn't, so the, the, the changing the gap at which you're looking in the quantum Hall, it will just change C, okay? So it will, the metric and the, and the very curvature are always, hand to hand. So here, basically, it's a, it's a, whether you are on the lattice or you are in a, to the electron gas, right? Your electrons will have some size associated with them. Uh, that's going to be the, the magnetic length or in the lattice, you can be the quantum metric that you compute. That will tell, tell you something about how easy it is for electrons to go very far, right? So, so like how, uh, how much work you have to do to polarize your system and to, to displace the charge from the, 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 the displace the charges. So why do you yeah. call this capacitance? It's just epsilon minus one for this uh, it's susceptibility, essentially. It's, it's polarizability. It's but if, you, if I think about it, it's, it's true. But if it, it, so, okay, but the capacitance of an insulator, that's precisely that, right? So it's the, the, the time. Capacitance uh, depends on geometry. Okay, so so if you if you are into the or is this quantum capacitance of the no this is geometric boring capacitance it's just a geometric contribution so they're ah, right. telling you what is the materials contribution to the energy that you can store in an insulin Wait a second, but so maybe the, the word okay so maybe this word is yes okay, that's a good point that's a suspicion so it's I have see right so uh, it's uh, the coefficient is uh, with omega is I thought it's just thermodynamics it's just b uh, energy, the ground state energy over in the potential. Or... That's right. That's right. So but, it's just thermodynamics, right? And but, it's just but, the ground state the, energy. Yeah. So, but, but I'm I'm giving you some way in which I can talk about the quantum hall and I can talk about any insulator and I can give you the information about the bend structure of the of the of the insulator and I can tell you exactly what this number is. Is something of order one, right? But this is some, something of order one. will know about the, the details of the material. So so this is basically, yeah, it's it's, it's giving you the value. Okay. So, so with the sign, sign of this, so a churn number is gonna change if you reverse the build, right? In the quantum hole. Yes. And a C also changes sign? Uh, no. The, I, okay. Uh, this is this is. Uh, I don't think this is this is really important. What is the sign of the of this term? So the the. I okay. I have. To, I have. Like to. negative capacitance and positive capacitance can be created. Um. Is the sign of the magnetic field is in omega c and the yeah yeah so yeah okay okay yeah that 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 makes sense. Um, okay, so 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 if this contribution, this this uh, this geometry in the um, in the is appearing in the non, non the non-dissipative part of the of the conductivity, it should also just Kramer's chronic, right? Like reflect what's happening and dissipation at 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 larger uh, frequencies. So you can have dissipation because you you have an electric field and you have a dipole moment that points in the same direction, or you can have um, uh, magnetic a magnetic dipole, which will also lead to uh, a Hall response in the plane perpendicular to the uh, to the longitudinal to the to the uh, to the to the electric to the dipole moment associated with the electric field direction associated with the electric field. Um, so you'll have dissipation from the real part of this and the imaginary part of that. And uh, of course, what we expect is that we can rewrite everything in terms of this quantity of this uh, object as well. So we can look at some rules of the dissipative part of conductivity. Um, and we can look 
at all possible generalized sum rules. So divided by omega times some eta here. Uh, and this sum rules is just going to be taking the various derivatives of this Q at time equals zero. So it's just going to, that's, that's, uh, so these sum rules are instantaneous uh, properties of matter that we can, that we can measure. It will be the mass, it will be the, 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 the susceptibility, it will be the uh, orbital magnetization, and they will just correspond to the various moments of this operator here, of this, of this object here. But the nice thing of writing it, and again, it's, this is just rewriting, but the nice thing of rewriting it in this way is that, again, I have a, complete, a very, very easy thing to calculate here because I write it in terms of projectors. It's completely gauge independent. And we did have um, historically a lot of problems uh, defining things like orbital magnetization in lattices as well. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, very good. So then let me look at... The eta equals zero sum rule, the eta equals zero sum rule is just going to be with um, uh, no frequency here. So it just picks up on the geometry. So that the real part of this was introduced by Sosa, Wilkins, and Martin. So that picks up just a trace of the, the, the metric. It's actually the only way that I know how to pick up the metric without any energy contributions. Um, there's also uh, the imaginary part of, uh, so the, 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 the whole part of the same sum rule is basically the TKNN. So it comes from uh, Kramer's chronic of TKNN, and that was really nicely described in the, the, the works by Liang, the recent works by Liang Fu and uh, uh, Yugo Nishi. So this, it's, the, you see that in the, the, the first moment is really just picking up the metric. Okay, so this is the first, the, 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 the zero derivative, it's just picking up the metric exam. Now we can look at eta equals one. Oh, eta equals one here is omega times G, but that for the, for the longitudinal part or omega times, um, uh, times very curvature for the whole part. That's just F sum rule. So F sum rule defines the mass, defines the effective mass of your system. Now, if you take a projector into all field bands and all empty bands, that effective mass is going to be the mere mass of the electron, right? So that's just what we know um, uh, that's very well established. But the, when we're talking about tight binding models and we're, when we're trying to restricting to so making some approximation, we need to define here some effective mass. Well, that, uh, uh, that approximation that we're doing, we're truncating this Q, right? Whereas basically saying who is P and who is Q. And when we do this truncation, when we, we set who is P and who, who is uh, the occupied states and the unoccupied states, we fix what is the effective mass, but we also fix other properties because all of the sum rules come from the same place. This is like a generating function. Um, now let's look at Pavis Torma results, right? When we have a, a, Fermi, a, a Fermi surface, but we have perfectly flat bands, which means that the, the, the so I, as I said, if I have a Fermi surface, I'm going to shift this derivative by the Drude weight. And so that means that I will have the effective mass, something coming from the Fermi surface plus something coming from geometry alone. If I have flat bands, then my mass coming from the Fermi surface, this is going to go to infinity. So this goes out. And I just have the geometric mass. Now this is energy times the mass. One over mass is energy times G. The only energy scale that I had was U, right? So it's again, it's this exact same result. You had U times G equals one over the, the mass. So in that sense, it applies uh, to there's a fight for also the Cooper problem. Now, the imaginary part of this sum rule is a little bit more obscure. We took a bit of time to find out about it, but it's called the dichroic sum rule. Um, and it picks up on the orbital magnetic moment. And uh, this, this was introduced in, the, the sum rule was introduced in, so in uh, by, by Ivo and, uh, and uh, Vanderbilt. Uh, the way of calculating the, or, the, the orbital magnetic moment in a gauge independent way that works you know, nicely in uh, periodic lattices, this was done uh, in these two papers by Vanderbilt and Chen Liu. 
Um, and this will just come out, that comes out exactly that when you when you compute this. So so it's it has got to be true for insulators only, the measuring part. This yeah, yeah, yeah. So so if you are away from the 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 no, this this okay. I, I I didn't think about what happens in this case for 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 metals yet. So, so maybe we should we should uh, talk. But this is for yes, this is for insulators. Okay, so I uh, I don't know if there's additional corrections for for metals. I didn't think about. So, eta minus one, so that will be g g plus i omega over frequencies. Um, that's real part, so dissipative part of sigma over omega squared, and uh, that will pick up on the susceptibility that I was talking about. So that, uh, but maybe I should call it capacitance, but it's the capacitance. Um, and uh, the, there's something that does not appear in the non-dissipative part, which is the, the non-reciprocal part of the susceptibility. So you can have like this uh, gyrotro gyrotropic permittivity. Uh, I learned this about from the, the gy gyration vector from Landau Lifshitz actually is there. So it's uh, uh, so it comes. It of course breaks time reversal symmetry, and it does not appear in the low low frequency response. Um, okay, but this again, like uh, uh, Leonid was saying, this is just we can understand this in very kind of simple terms. So if we think about uh, just harmonic oscillator, right? In a harmonic oscillator, I will have my length squared in, in uncertainty principle. I will just have uh, the L squared to go like one over uh, M times the ground state energy. And this is pretty much what we are seeing when we have quantum Hall effect, where there's really just one energy, one energy transition is really the simplest possible situation where all of the sum rules are going to be powers of omega c, okay, times lb squared. So metric and curvature is going to be lb squared times the certain number. Uh, inverse mass and orbital magnetization is going to lb squared times omega c. Permittivity is going to be over omega c. The important part is that here is that all of these things are defined consistently, right? Because we do have come all from one and the one and same to answer. If we have, uh, now dispersive bands, things become different uh, and more complicated, but but we can still get a lot of information about them from looking at the metric and the and the and the, the very curvature. And that's like I think kind of what is what is uh, what is insightful here is that if I so here if I look at the zero uh, uh, sum rule, that's just very curvature. This is for the Haldane model. So I have here turn band. And here I have in the black line, you can see metric. It diverges at the, the transition. But then I just convolute that with energies and I get the inverse mass. That will be the this line here, the, the orange one. I can get orbital magnetization. That will be this orange one. Um, I can get dielectric constant in the gyration vector by looking, this is the, the, light, uh, the light blue one which is going to be more divergent and here as well. Um, so, so in a sense, I think that we can, I, if, we want to, if I want to think about what this Q of T means is really characterizing something about the zero point motion of the insulator itself. Um, and uh, um, that will not be in a simple, in a simple case where we just have one single energy and uh, if we have more energies, that will allow me to maybe make some bounds on this size. Uh, and this was already like then Kivelson in 81, he has bounded basically this length squared or this metric uh, size of the, the Vanier functions by one over mass times the gap. And I think we'll hear about some general bounds on gap as well from, from Liang today, uh, tomorrow. Uh, so basically what we know now, like that we didn't know here, because this is a one-dimensional result, is that topological invariants can really push up this, this responses. Sure. So, okay. The second, okay. <laughs> so say this. Okay, material, so, so the, from the dielectric constants, then you can take something, know something about materials, right? Which is, which is kind of nice. So you can see them organizing by like, 
very well localized atomic insulators, uh, ionic insulators, covalent insulators, and topological insulators will have larger and larger and larger metrics. And uh, we can find some very, to make a est better estimate for the gap, not like the exact gap, but take like, like more typical transition, like the, the peak in the, in the absorption spectrum. And if we do that, this is, we use some tricks from old semiconductor physics, the pen gap. Uh, and if we do that, we can see that the metrics related like log to the, to the gap, and there's some outliers. And these outliers are basically coming from topology. This is topological insulators. You have these obst uh, atomic obstructions uh, in certain cases like silicon or uh, germanium or, 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 or diamond. They are just, even if they have very large gap, they're still delocalized because symmetry imposes so. So they're still covalent. And uh, this is, you know, what the only the reason why, even though diamond is transparent, so you wouldn't really expect any very large refractive index, but diamond is transparent. But because of this, uh, the, the atomic obstruction, this atomic obstruction has a very large refractive index compared with everybody else. And that's, you know, diamonds are shiny because of that, which is really cute. I think. So, okay, that's, the, <laughs> that's my conclusions. Uh, we define this operator for this object is not really remission. The Kubo formula for conductivity just takes the time derivative of that. Uh, and we can write generalize some rules as the various derivatives of this at time equals zero. And that gives you some kind of like, you know, maybe consistent way uh, of defining all of these quantities together in periodic systems in a gauge invariant way. Um, and yeah, thank you for your attention. A couple of quick questions. Uh, Nita. Uh, another question. So on cycle relation relates dissipative part to some irreversibility. So could you elaborate what is basically the irreversibility? What defines the arrow of time in your case? Because it feels like you are trying to push the charge and you get some dual heating, but what is irreversible here? Well, so you do, in order to have dissipation, you do need to have some background electromagnetic field, which you'll couple to. Um, so this is, this is uh, the, you know, I, so this is exactly follows the, the exact same way that you think about dissipation otherwise, right? So, so the, 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 you just have some allowed optical transitions that can decay. So these intraband transitions. These are all intraband transitions. This is the weight of characterizing the intraband transitions, but I'm just right. You're writing it in a new object that kind of like generates all of these things in a, in a gauge, in a, in a, in a gauge independent way that it's easy to compute for periodic systems. Much more naive question. Uh, when you talk about flat band systems, mm -hmm. you talk about the one of the mass being zero and then the geometrical mass. Mm -hmm. Suppose that I start with a really naive question. Suppose that I try to do perturbation theory in interaction, which I shouldn't do when mass with the band the flat, but I try to do. I suppose it generates some dispersion and some mass coming from interaction. Mm -hmm. Is it the same or it's totally different? I, I so I didn't really make any assumptions here uh, about uh, so so about who is occupied and who is empty, right? So so if you you're just renormalizing your states, you can right. have a dispersion, and you will you will, you'll just renormalize your Grutter weights. Right. But I'm asking is this what you call geometrical uh, distribution of the mass? Can we view it as interaction generated mass? No, 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 not at all. So the, the, that will do something to the Druda part. So this is this is uh, this geometric part really comes from all possible transitions, optical transitions coming uh, like very very large energies. So what I'm talking about geometric mass is is the bare mass of the electron. The, you know the only the only reason. So so if you think about if you start with the p squared over two m theory, right? All you get is the mass of the electron. Now you dis you you put you put a potential. The potential is periodic. It will make electrons kind of tumble into places, make orbitals, and so on. Sure. Uh, so what what I'm saying here is that this is telling you how you distribute this information from through Fermi surface through the 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 the, the phases of the wave functions that just distributes here 
between it becomes either some firm surface contributions or it becomes some uh, co contributions to the geometric part of the test. It's interesting because <laughs> Nish was telling me this the, the, just uh, just before we left New York. It's in Ashcroft and Mermin. If you go and look at the the their contributions, uh, there's additional contributions to the mass on Ashcroft and Mermin coming from the interband contributions. They uh, these are the these are the terms that appear there. Correct. Right. I'm afraid we will need to move from our questions to, to, to the discussion to break uh, So, yeah, thanks very much. We did back 10 years. Oh, yeah, hey, how are you doing? Yes, good. Uh, usually the water, I mean, as you hope to be fine. Uh, yeah, I mean, one day they've already studied. Uh, yeah, I, but I think they just yeah, 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 that's like, yeah. 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 I mean, I do understand like there's like, because if you have a reverse investigation, like, and you just have to get it back to the question. So, as you can see, all these things, like, oh, okay, I mean, I'm just yeah, 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 yeah,
But I think, like, you know, this is actually, yeah, this is interesting. Yeah, so you, maybe you can use fluctuation dissipation to use the results from the conclusion to describe something. So, so, well, it's not actually so it's not like that. I found it very interesting. There are, I guess, some other things, but I think it's just like, I'm going to say, 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 I'm going to that becomes the responsible function of that. A symmetric part is not a responsible function. It basically helps you something in terms of the parts of Turns out the conductor is so good. Right. 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 No, I want to die now. This is the minutes. Like, this is the reason. I don't know what it makes. So, yeah, I mean, it's me. And then, yeah. Yeah, it feels like if I'm, 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 Really, really fast. Like my brain is going like faster than I'm talking, even though I'm talking really fast. And all of this stuff, and it's wow, that's dangerous. I am not that great. Oh, I'm like, wow, this is great. I'm not. That's not my and then at some point, like I can't engage in the happiness because I know that it's like my brain is not averaging the energy well. And at some point, I'm just going to crash. The question is like, you know, the thing is that I'll start talking to now, I'll start bothering the folks with the same nice little device altogether. This is just a trick. I'll start by the check to me and then I'll move on. That I don't think you didn't want to talk here, but when you get to talk, okay, good. I think you want to. Yeah, yeah. I think we break this over time, right? I mean, it's really the power of the curve, the only because that you have a something slightly like decaying. Right. And uh, I mean, there's a plot, there's fine, but like, for example, like if you just look at the definition of this thing, and it, it, it only the exponential i something, right? It does not contain anything about the exponential decaying marker. Yeah, so I think it's a why, why, yeah, so that's the whole white part. So, like, why you can you have power in this expression? Well, it's actually, it's actually there, right? Because so, suppose, suppose I have just that. Uh, Fusion, right? Suppose, suppose I'm looking at that because you can have a that's the only one that should be able to get this other thing. And uh, if you can get this, this quantity Q, T, it's like the correlator in both, uh, of a position of an electron itself, and it's, it's not a fancy. Uh, and if you diffuse, this is just going to be two times the fusion constant times the uh, And this diffusion constant. Does have power, right? Because the fusion constant is yeah, but the theory of the fusion is different. You look how you define it. 
Yeah, if I was John, she's like, right, 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 can you plug in all this like inter interval stuff? Um, and um, like what ways of sort of mapping? Yes, not 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 the same. Oh, we have to use the Yeah, but again, like my point is, how can you get the information you're plugging in about the about the power? Yeah, just for one point. So like, yeah, I, 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 I will say like, this the decomp the, the decomps over here. Yeah, but then when you talk about in this, then uh, you are obviously idolized your model, right? Like you do not include any power like when you talk in the reflection. No, I do have to include power, otherwise this one will diverge like Yeah, but you are definitely trying to include them. Okay. That's my point. Right, but it includes this, right? It includes the correlators of the operators. And uh, I, so what I'm saying is that Q, Q, how you define Q is like, uh, that was like something like, something like Q. And uh, there's no how in this right. Way. But that what what there is this is um this is this contains all the states for you. This contains all the states for the ground state. And do you isolate this the sum of isolated current You do a bunch of maths, so and all you get is just this correlator and the position of variables within the same way. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so okay, then let me ask you this way. So how, where did you put the information about the tau? Yeah, you know, the information tau. about the tau is, is here, P. Yeah, it's one of those. So P is uh Some over, you know, right? So this is right, right, This this way function solve certain that may or may not be and it does contain the color. That is much more than the solar setting the you guys is asking us where how do we do the interval term? Ah, that's a missing definition, but yeah, it really comes with this. Yeah, I understand that, but uh, I mean, well, 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 I am not too confident about the things that. Uh, yeah, that's so we are. Scattering doesn't come directly in the calculation. It comes in, you have to take it by hand. So from this calculation, what we'll get is, so we'll just get that sigma of the A and C. Now, if you get something that is constant, then it's not time scale and frequency scale. So you guys are one more thing, which you have to It's very important to us. I mean, it's not. It's not very different on actually. Nobody idea of your question is what it was like here. So uh but then another interesting thing is that this object is such this object is that you are defining. In the non interacting case, it comes up to be the yeah. But then you can also define it with the And it does show like a transition, but then we were to look at uh, the Anderson and the problem. This thing does what you say. Uh, so it sort of knows about it, but then you know, it's a bit of a tip. Then, uh, the uh, yeah, this is the common thing. No, really, for the common thing. It's not that very common, right? But it's very common. And that's not there. Yeah, that's the obvious one. Uh, so, the, 
Yeah, yeah, in the like we just see like this is very easy. Uh, right. Yeah, I'm just put like phases and then so you have one day system, you put some phase five. This is very easy. So I feel like you ought to be able to do that. Hey, yeah, 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 I see your point. Yeah. Um, what about the number? Mm -hmm. I think there is a line. You have to do it. I think there is there's a paper by Scalpy point inside. So it's So, so there's actually like this. Uh, there's actually fairly well, well known. So, um, um, so the example I know are in 2D. Um, yeah, so so yeah, that's so weird. Are used to describe it? Yes, so situations. Yeah, it's and, it's and those guys, so you know, they can look at the models, models and there's like the balance to follow. The other Latin version of the. You don't have access to that. Yeah, well, but, that's yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, I mean, they really meant for like, you know, they like, literally have like emergent yeah. ideas. Yeah. Like I said, they kind of use the yeah. this yeah. 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 But it's a discretization that I think deserves the method. Oh, and so yeah. they define on some like, it's like a little. Yeah. 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 So I try to and they and they have like some rules that figure from kind of like just because they're not just not. Yeah, this is knowledgeable and it obeys the kind of things that I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so so just a little bit that it is qualified actually. Oh, this is okay. Model it has an exact, you know, the current and exactly what I've done as such. It has to be quality, it has to density. And I like this momentum, which is like this. So, weirdly enough, I don't know an example with one D. I'm sure this is probably a simpler version. Right. You know, I don't know. It's not a simple D, which is fine, but it does actually check all the boxes. Yeah, which I don't know. So, that's a great example. No, I'm glad we also discussed this. Like, for some reason, I didn't have that. It's also the thing is that I actually worked on those things. Yeah, for some reason, like, anyway, this will give me a certain thing. Yeah, sure. I actually don't have an example. 
I wish I had like a system of one. So you know, it's a bit of a case. It's just like, yeah, the RFP is not Yeah, it might be. Yeah, it might be. So the is like class of all stuff. Yeah, exactly. Um, and like, so it's perfectly well. Yeah, I think it's currently pretty reasonable. Like, so I mean, it has, and then, um, yeah, it has been even like this popular, like. Oh, yeah. I wouldn't know how to read it. Okay, yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah, that shouldn't be just like you can only do that because it gives you a process. Sure. Yeah. I would imagine it's not the same. I think the version we use is discrete time. Not like the beginning part of the whole time. We do have one awesome version part, so we have eight. But it's like a It is not going to like non disagreeable part of the look. Oh, but you just need like a sub of the GDP part of the part of the GDP 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 part of I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think that's going to happen. that's not going to happen. Anyway, that is a shock. So you already said that one is probably not what you want to tell me. Yeah, I think it's actually, yeah. I mean, I was thinking about this because of what you said yesterday. It was really good. Yeah, and it's also really simple. It would be a good thing. It would make no sense. And they can make some of the people that you rely on. So this is precisely that you reach yeah, it's with the with I have I should say like I but as far as I know, you cannot tell. Uh, no, so people are using it. I think it's yeah, like, yeah, so, like, really good to notice. <laughs> yeah, we can that we can. I would assume it's like a procedure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 So that um, is okay. somehow. So yeah, no, so it would take some measure of the hand. No, I guess that's it. But yeah. I don't know. Like it would be, it would be like, you know, like the three one in software. Right? That's how they'll get like three. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. It's so it's so the more hand, yeah, it's yeah. 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 Yeah
First, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak here. Um, a little bit surreal to share the stage with all my six heroes. So I really yeah, appreciate the, the opportunity. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, systems of uh, many particles who where the particles obey constraints, which uh, lead to a questioning of their kinetic energy. So um, an example which I'm not going to talk about in this talk, but which is hopefully familiar to everyone, is uh, the quantum Hall effect. Okay, so in the quantum Hall effect, uh, a strong magnetic field constrains the motion of electrons to land like electron orbitals, which is their kinetic energy. Okay. Um, but of course, you know the physics of the system is not not boring. Uh, and it's made not boring partly by the fact that. Uh, in, in many quantum Hall systems, you still have composite degrees of freedom, which are able to move around it. Um, a different kind of way of quenching the kinetic energy of particles, which is maybe a bit easier to understand theoretically, which is why I'm going to be talking about, is to uh, impose certain types of conservation laws, which um, quench particles' kinetic energy. So as kind of a case study that we'll be returning to several times in this talk, we're going to consider a system of particles with the following conservation laws. We're going to consider both the total number of particles in the system and the dipole moment uh, there are all components of the dipole. And this just means the center of mass. We're going to have these two conservation laws. Um, okay, why does this conservation law lead to a quenching of kinetic energy? Well, I'm just going to illustrate that with the following cartoon. Okay, so consider what happens when we have, uh, say, a 1D chain and we put a single particle uh, at some site in isolation from other particles. Now, in fact, we have to conserve the total center of mass of the system. It means that this uh, particle cannot move, right? Because if it, if it tries to hop to the left, uh, it's going to increase the center of mass in the system by one of the units of the lattice spacing. And okay, if it tries to hop to the right, it's also going to increase the center of mass. Okay? So a single particle by itself is, has its kinetic energy completely quenched by the conservation. Uh, nevertheless, uh, collective motion is still possible in these systems. So if I have two particles, say, on the same site, uh, they can still do some amount of motion. In particular, they can do something like this. They can push off of each other and move in opposite directions. So some collective motion is still possible. Uh, going through that same example, but now in an environment where you have sort of a background density of particles, we can consider the following situation. Uh, we have Let's consider a situation where I have a particle hole pair, which are on the adjacent sides of this uh, lattice. This, this particle hole pair I'm going to refer to as a dipole in, in what follows. And this dipole object, by virtue of having no net charge number, is free to move around uh, without violating this conservation law. So using the same process that we just looked at, I can <clears throat> move this bound state over uh, on the lattice. So, like in the quantum Hall problem, we have single particle being, being completely quenched, but collective bound states being able to move around. Now, some other uh, examples of constraint models, which I'm not going to talk about, but which people may be familiar with, would include things like uh, kinetically constrained models, and that people think about in StatMet with, when analyzing uh, glasses, and also maybe closer to our interests here, you could also consider systems where you have strong interactions which lead to the geometrical frustration and kind of frustrate the ability of particles to move around. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about those either of those examples in detail. Um, okay, so let me just give some motivation for why one would want to study systems with constraints like this. Um, for me, I personally have kind of two broad classes of motivation which are going to um, be kind of looked at in the two halves of this talk. Uh, in the first half, we're going to focus on equilibrium physics, and we're going to ask how these constraints affect the kind of like wave particle competition, which is central to a lot of the many body physics that we do. And the reason why this is something interesting to look at is that when you impose constraints like this, you end up with systems that are, in some sense, intrinsically interactive. So if, if motion of particles is only possible by some, uh, is only facilitated by the presence of other particles in some collective way, then you're not really, these systems are not really going to have a free non-interacting limit. And so it's interesting to think about what their kind of many body physics. Uh, okay, and then the other, on, in the second part of the talk, we're going to 
be looking at how constraints like this affect thermalization dynamics, right? So I think it's relatively uh, easy to imagine that we, when you start imposing constraints like this, you're going to make the dynamics less ergodic and you're going to slow down motion of particles, right? And understanding exactly how that works is going to occupy the second part of it. Cool. Okay, so first part, uh, equilibrium physics. Uh, this The first part is going to be illustrated through this vignette of uh, dipole conserving closed Hubbard models that uh, I did a little bit of work on uh, recently. Um, this work, yeah, it de definitely did not come out of a vacuum, so I just wanted to point out some important intellectual predecessors here. There were some papers by Subir and Erez on uh, mod insulators in, in strong electric fields. The relation of that to the present talk will become clear shortly. Um, there's also some work on uh, quantum hall, the quantum hall problems on cylinders, which turns out to be equivalent to some dipole conserving model in one dimension. Uh, I'm not going to explain this, but if you're interested, uh, you could ask me about this connection later. All right, so uh, just to kind of get us all on the same page, one slide about the Bose Hubbard model. So, Bose Hubbard model, we have bosons hopping on some lattice with uh, chemical potential mu, some on site repulsive interaction u, and some uh, kinetic energy, standard kinetic energy. Um, Okay, this model, of course, has the following uh, phase diagram that we're all familiar with. At small kinetic energy streaks, you have uh, mod insulators in, uh, where all the particles are localized in real space. And then when you start cranking up the kinetic en energy, you, you uh, the particles delocalize and you have a superfluid. So we want to understand how this uh, physics goes through when we impose this extra conservation law of dipole moment and quench the kinetic energy. And so, to, to, just to be very concrete, this is the kind of model we're going to be studying. So we take the bose hubbard model, and we add this extra symmetry. So, of course, the, the on-site parts of this, this model don't need to change, right? Uh, so the, the mu and the u term are the same. But we're going to need to modify the kinetic energy to conserve that moment. Okay. And so as we were, we were just, uh, just looking at, the kind of the simplest processes which allow particles to move in this uh, dipole-conserving way are these kind of two particle push and pull processes. So we're just going to add those to the same time where we're going to study the ground state resistance. Okay. Uh, and, and notice that uh, in keeping with what I was saying about these models being intrinsically interacting, their, their kinetic energy term looks uh, is definitely not straight to you know, it's collective. Okay, so uh, this part, this model actually is very simple to, to analyze theoretically. Uh, and the way you analyze it is you just make the, you just go back to this following observation. The observation that this, uh, these dipoles are free to move or move about the system uh, uh, at will. Right? So when you start cranking up the kinetic energy strength in this model, the system is going to want to lower its kinetic energy. And it does so by allowing the, the things which can move to kind of disperse across the system and, and form a suit. So what's going to happen when we start cranking up the kinetic energy is that we're going to form a both Einstein connotated of these objects, because they're the things which can move the system. So did you say, I mean, is it tough field or, I mean, or does it matter? Yeah, let's, let's, let's work at unit building, for example. Okay. So, unit building. So when you start going to very low fillings, you're going to get into trouble because you know, motion is not going to be possible and you're going to kind of freeze out into some system glassy state, right? That's going to be less interesting from the point of view of ground state. So we're going to, we're going to assume we have some, a density of particles which is large enough to facilitate motion. Is you know? there a threshold for it or is it? Yeah, yeah, there's a threshold. So it depends on kind of the range of your hop, correlated hopping interactions. So uh, if, you, if you like, always assume that the particle density on average is greater than one, it's greater than or equal to one, and you'll be safe. Yeah, yes. <clears throat> These uh, fluids can conserve center of mass. Is there a difference with ordinary superfluids or can they flow? Okay, so yeah, don't, don't steal my thunder here. We're going to get to that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, any other questions? Okay, so um, as we were describing, we're going to form we're going to form a superfluid. This kind of this object, which is because this is the thing that can move. And then uh, once we give an expectation value to this object. We essentially unquench the kinetic energy of, of single single bosons, and that's the way in which that works is illustrated here, right? So when, when you develop this expectation value, you kind of unlock a single particle hopping for the bosons, 
And the single particle hopping is kind of mediated, is mediated by the phase of this, the condensate of your dipole objects. Okay, so we get the, the model, which looks like. That's basically all there is to it. And considerations uh, of that, that sort of lead to the following phase diagram, which I'm not going to describe. So, of course, at, at low kinetic energies, we just, we're definitely going to get a mod insulator again. Just out of the conservation laws, we're not going to change the nature of the mod insulator. But of course, what's interesting is what happens when you start cranking up T over U. Now, uh, when T over U gets large enough, we're going to condense these objects, the, these dipoles, right? Because they're the things which move. So we're going to we're going to form a condensate of them. But uh, single particles are going to remain gapped after this condensate is formed. We're going to be in a situation like this. This is called a dipole condensate. So superfluid is these dipole objects. Uh, but then since single particle motion is kind of unlocked by the, for, the formation of this uh, condensate, we'll eventually be able to reach a phase where you have uh, single bonds under condensed as well. We would be in this kind of situation. Okay. I just wanted to briefly highlight the physics of, of uh, this phase, which uh, of the Bose-Einstein insulator. Okay, so what is this phase like? Well, it has a, a condensate of bosons, so it's a B and C. And accordingly, it's uh, gapless and it's compressible, as you would expect from a Bose Einstein condensate. Okay. <clears throat> However, uh, it's actually insulating. So if you compute the conductivity at zero momentum, it just vanishes at all frequencies. Uh, so this is just a simple consequence of this conservation, right? The, the conservation law says if particles move to the right, an equal number of particles have to move to the left. And this just prevents you from getting a, a conductivity at zero momentum. Um, and accordingly, to answer that question, it's uh, not a superfluid. So even though we form this this post condensate, the fact that we're insulating, the fact that we have the symmetry means that we don't have a Meissner effect. It provides an interesting way of separating these two. Yeah. So by post Einstein, uh, so you mean that it's a it's a liquid state? Is that what you mean? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it, it has uh, by both Einstein condensate. I just mean that uh, you know we condense the bosons by a long range order for the for the bosons, uh, uh, precisely this. And um, when you turn on a small uh, single particle hopping, yeah, does this uh, electrical insulating state immediately become conducting, or does it become a super fluid? Yeah, yeah. So that that yeah, a single particle hopping which breaks the symmetry is going to give you some conductivity in this phase. That 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 that'll be irrelevant in this phase. So your dipole kind of state will survive, but yeah, that will affect the nature. Does it turn it into a, a superfluid immediately or an ordinary superfluid immediately, or does it? Oh, uh, yeah, or did your solvent? Yeah, because you already, you already have the, the, the bosons which are condensed, nice. So, as long as you give them a little bit of, of room to transport charge, then they're going to do it very easily. Thanks. Um, yeah, great. Okay, so this is the, yeah. Um, in, in, I, I set myself a really ruthless <laughs> schedule for this talk, so I'm actually just going to move on. Uh, I hope, I hope this just gives you a flavor of what's going on in the ground states. Um, if people are interested in seeing beyond the cartoons and want to see some numerics and actual calculations, you can read these papers. Also, we have some work on the Fermi covered model version of this. But okay, I'm going to move on. Um, I wanted to briefly touch on experiments, however, before going on to dynamics. Uh, so the, the most natural system in which we would look for this kind of physics me at least is uh, to consider what happens when we have bosonic atoms in a tilted optical lattice. So we, we make some lattice like this, we put bosonic atoms in it, and we arrange such that the tilt of the lattice is much larger than all the energy scales, all, all the other energy scales in the problem. Okay? The reason why this uh, gives you dipole conservation is that single particle hopping is strongly you know, off resonant. Right? It costs a lot, large amount of energy to do a single particle hop. But if you do a correlated hop like this, then you're on shell and, and you're, that, 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 that's totally fine as far as the tilt. And indeed, this was the, uh, this was the context in which the work by Subir and Eros was uh, done. Uh, okay, so in terms of actual experiments, well, a few years ago, there were some really beautiful experiments in Manuel Block and, and uh, Basim Baker's group on exploring the physics of, uh, of atoms in, in this, in, in this strongly tilted regime, they were mostly looking at how density waves diffuse and looking at some hydrodynamic aspects of this. Uh, so not exactly what I was the, the physics that I was just describing. Um, 
but recently there's been some momentum building up for looking at sort of the dynamics of different types of excitations in these hubbard models and maybe trying to address the, the dipole condensate and this exotic insulating state that we were just discussing um very very recently there are some ongoing experiments that i was uh, a theoretical consultant for on uh, that were run in the rubidium quantum gas microscope in Greiner's lab, just kind of demonstrating the ability to prepare states with dipoles in them and image the dynamics of these excitations, just kind of get the ball going. So, um, yeah, great. So that's the equilibrium part of the talk. Uh, now I'm going to talk about dynamics. I apologize for the kind of thematic uh, discord between these two apps, but whatever. Um, so when we think about dynamics in constraint systems. A uh, typical question one would ask is following kind of low bow, low brow question. You have a bunch of uh, particles that are going to, undergoing some form of constrained dynamics. And we prepare them in some big blob uh, and we watch them relax and we ask, what, what is the character of their relaxation? <laughs> so as we, as we mentioned earlier, when you start imposing constraints like this, it's easy to imagine that you're gonna slow down diffusion in some way. And there's been a lot of recent work on understanding exactly the extent to which diffusion is slowed down. Uh, and again, I just wanted to use this uh, example of dipole conserving systems to kind of illustrate one example of the phenomenon that you might uh, see in these kinds of systems. Okay. So we're going to be looking at how particles diffuse in the presence of this dipole center of mass conservation. Okay. Now there's a there's a simple thought experiment that you can do which uh, immediately will convince you that the answer has to be interesting. And that thought experiment is the following. You just take your particles and you place them in a box like this. And you place the particles not at the center of the box, but that may be displaced from the center by a little bit. And then you watch them evolve. OK, uh, why, why is this interesting? Well, let's consider the steady state that these particles evolved to at long times. In the absence of any constraints on how these particles move, they would just uh, uniformly fill the box at late times. That's the solution to the diffusion equation, right? Uniform density. But uh, that's not possible because the, their center of mass here is conserved by the dynamic. So whatever you get at late times, it has to have its center of mass in the okay. And that's impossible to have in a uniform distribution. So the, the late time steady state of this dynamics cannot be a uniform distribution. Okay. So yeah, unfortunately, due to time constraints, I'm just going to have to tell you what the answer is. Uh, it's too bad. But uh, the answer turns out to be that the particles will exponentially localize themselves to the boundary of the box with a scale set by the center of mass. It's just, is that, oh, yeah, sorry. But Ethan, I'm, I'm requiring the center of mass to be fixed normally isn't something that we do with the box because the box exerts forces at the, I mean, it, it says, there's a potential that says you can't go outside that. So um, I understand you can write down this model, but is there sort of motivation for why you would want to fix the center of mass even in the presence of box constraint? Uh, well, the I think I can imagine doing this in a in a like a, some tilted lattice with a hard balls. If you if you want a physical instantiation of this. Yeah, um, but, but when it, but when you get to the end of the lattice, yeah. why should the center of mass be fixed? The, when well, you, you get have to like the hard a, hard, wall. a hard wall. Yeah, when you get to the hard wall, why should the center of mass of the whole system be fixed? Well, you, so you, you can, the, the, rate, the way in which the center of mass was being fixed here in the tilted optical lattice setup was from some strong energy tilt, right? So the hopping, the hopping of particles near the, the, the kind of the boundary of the lattice is still going to have to work in a way which, constrain, which conserves total energy if the tilt of the lattice is very strong. So in the situation where you have this kind of weird looking potential, energy conservation and the, the inability to dissipate energy to your environment is still going to be um, A different answer is that uh, this is a thought experiment to, in, to illustrate why this diffusion is going to be interesting. Yeah. And it's going to be interesting even when we take off the walls. Um, but yeah. Thanks for the question. So, yeah. Is it true that as you move that center of mass to the right, this sort of suddenly changes as continuously as it gets time. Oh, uh, well, it'll change with it. It'll be like it'll be really, okay. really localized, really le less localized. And, and then the center of mass and the center of the box will be uniform and then it'll localize over here. Um, okay. so, so the point of putting this in the box is just to illustrate that uh, 
we're no, we're, we're definitely not going to have this as the equation describing how the particles relax, right? And or anything like this, because uh, any equation like this is only going to have uniform steady states. But we need to at least in principle allow for the possibility of this lo very localized state. So uh, yeah, so it, it turns out that the actual equation describing the the dynamics of these particles looks something like this. So you have some nonlinear equation with a bunch of derivatives. Um, I'm not going to explain where it comes from. Um, yeah, it has some interesting scaling features, but uh, let me just uh, <coughs> move on for now. So this is just a, a vignette of like the kinds of things that can happen when you start imposing these things. Okay. Um, okay, great. Now, in the last part of the talk, I tried to resist, but I couldn't resist. I just really wanted to talk about some more recent work um, on, again, on constrained dynamics, but uh, maybe, again, thematically a little bit different. Um, and the, the more recent work is involved with thinking about the following question of, well, we saw that when you impose these uh, dipole constraints, you slow down the motion of the particles uh, as they're produced. So how slow can you go? Uh, in particular, can you come up with some local, simple local constraints which render the relaxational dynamics exponentially slow as a function of system effects? Okay. So, we're, we're basically look, looking to see like how localized non-thermalizing behavior can you produce with local constraints. Um, the reason why this question might be a little bit uh, might be interesting is that you know we're not going to allow energy barriers to give us slow relaxation, so we're we're not going to have energy conservation, and we're not going to have disorder. Okay, we're going to try be trying to produce slow dynamics only using the presence of these constraints. Okay, and. The strategy for doing this is we're going to try to create effective spot space localization by engineering the dynamics to have very, very sparse connectivity in the Hilbert space. Okay. So uh, to kind of illustrate what I mean by that, uh, I'm going to draw pictures like this. So each vertex in this graph will be a state in Hilbert space. Okay. And I'm going to draw edges between two states if they're connected by the dynamics. So, for example, if the Hamiltonian has a non-zero matrix element between two states, I'll draw an edge. Okay. Now, in a typical system, this kind of graph will be very highly connected. So, you know, in a chain of length L, I'll have maybe two of the L states in here, but the, the diameter of this graph will only be L. Okay. So this is kind of what a typical system would be like. And the, the goal of this part of the talk is to come up with a set of constraints which will give you something that looks like this. Okay, so we want the we want the like the Hilbert space to be connected in a very very sparse way, which has a very very large diameter. So if we can do this, then dynamics in the system is going to be very slow just because it you have to go. It takes a long time to get from between two points if they're very far. Apart. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, this type of typical system, this makes sense for like a random matrix, but if you take something like a local Hubbard model and you look at, yeah. you know, the hopping term there, it's it's very sparse and kind of fractal as a Fox space matrix. Yeah, so, yeah, right, right. But when, when you when you, act, when you act with like E to the I HT, or look at powers of the Hamiltonian, right? So the Hamiltonian, if you have a bunch of terms, like a sum of terms on all sites, right? And you start taking powers of that, right? And you take maybe about L powers, and you basically, after taking L powers, you have, you know, uh, uh, whatever L choose, well, you have some large number of different terms that you can shoot in that. And usually you need about L powers of that to create any kind of uh, copy process that you want. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so you need usually L on that one. Then what do yeah. How do, you, how do you define the diameter? Oh, just that you, you look at all pairs of vertices in the graph. And you find the pair of vertices such that the minimum distance between those two vertices is, is large, is large, and then the, that distance defines the dams. Yeah, so we want to make a graph like this. So I would like to explain how this is done. Um, I want to, however, have the following caveat, which is that uh, we're going to be talking about some exact results, and uh, for which I apologize because we're going to be talking about semi groups and all this. Very formal things, uh, which is probably going to be the most formal thing that is going to be talked about in this conference. So I apologize for that. Um, but okay, that's how that life like goes. Um, our construction is going to work uh, using some 
some fundamental properties of the theory of discrete groups. So for those interested, I'm just going to briefly explain how to Okay, so uh, we're going to fix G, a uh, discrete group, and we're going to write it like this. So it has some generators, uh, G1 to Gn, as an identity element E. And these generators obey some uh, relations, which determine the structure of the group. Right? So for example, Z2 has one generator, it's where the identity group C squared has two generators that commute. Um, we're going to consider a model whose Hilbert space on, on we're going to consider 1D chains, where on each side of the chain, we're going to have a Hilbert space whose basis elements are labeled by the generators of the group. Okay. So this is just some formal construction that we're going to be adopting to get slow data. Okay. When we do this, this is just notation, but when we use this notation, we realize that each product state defines a group element because you can just multiply the generators uh, in this Chain, uh, along the chain and come up with some group element associated with that. Okay. So for example, if we have like a three site chain and I have I have a this state that's associated with the identity element because they multiply the okay. so that's just the construction that we're gonna have. Okay. Now we're gonna impose some constraints, right? Let's talk about constraint dynamics. So what's the constraint? The constraint is that the dynamics preserves the group element that you get when you do this multiplication. So if we have a Hamiltonian, you know, we can the Hamiltonian can substitute two uh, two states here with two others if they're the products of their group elements are identical. Okay, so we're preserving this group element that you get when you do the multiplication. I hope that makes sense. Okay. That's the set, that's our constraint. Okay. So then uh, this, there's this, the usual point of view, uh, which you, you can adopt from looking at the system, which is to view the dynamics of the system essentially as like a computer program, which tries to figure out when two different product states give the same group element, right? Because the dynamics is preserving this group. Element, right? So in pictures, you might, you might, that you might feed in some state like this to the dynamics, and then you'll act on it. Yeah, you know, you'll evolve it in time, and the state will get updated uh, in such a way that the group element you get from multiplying these things across the chain is preserved. Okay. That's the, that's the setup. Um, in, kind of the math and CS literature, uh, this dynamics turns out to be related to the following problem, which is, suppose I have two strings of, uh, of, group, of group generators. When do these two strings of the group generators multiply to the same group element? Okay. And this is called the semi-group word problem, and this is a very famous problem in mathematics and computer science going back, you know, 100, 100 years about. Um, and the crucial, fact that it's going to be relevant to us is that this problem is hard in general. Uh, by, and by hard, I mean computationally hard. Okay. So in particular, if, uh, if if you have some dynamics, which which is kind of evolving, evolving different words into different equivalent words, then uh, this dynamics is, is essentially trying to solve this problem, of determining when two uh, strings represent the same group element. Right? And the thing that you can you can show is that when this this problem has high computationally computational complexity, the dynamics is slow. So you can directly connect the dynamics of the system to the computational complexity of the problem. A question. Oh yeah, thanks. sorry. Yeah. How important is locality to this? So I, I just missed like uh, you know who yeah, look, who can with which and, and is that important to the difficulty of the problem? Uh, non locality doesn't help you. So if you if you if you're given a if you're given some string of generators and you want to know whether it's equivalent to some other string, the best algorithm that you have is to just like randomly apply relations at different points in the word. And all, all of that is local. So this general strategy that would be implemented by like a Hamiltonian of, of obeying these constraints of just like randomly doing stuff to the word, that's the best you can do in general. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I'm confused by the words randomly and Hamiltonian to me. Uh -huh. How do you find it deterministic? Process that maps one state to the other and gives it these. Yeah, yeah. So the so I, I'm imagining when you when I, when I do like e to the minus i h t for large t and I expand and and I look at what that does to these strings. I imagine it just kind of produces a big sum of a bunch of different equivalent strings with like uh, you know various different random coefficients. Right. The, the details are not super important. If you like, you can always you don't replace this all with like unitary circuit which has the same classification. Okay, so that's the, I hope that makes sense. Um, so just to kind of 
reiterate this pictorially, we have low complexity of this problem. You are in this kind of typical situation. And when the problem has high computational complexity, you can guarantee that your Hilbert space is going to look like this. So uh, in the last like one minute uh, that I have, or don't have, that's better, um, I would like to address this complaint that hopefully people in the audience have. Let me show you a concrete example. So if you want to get a concrete example, you go uh, read math papers from the 1960s, which discuss uh, group, uh, semi-group word problems with high complexities. So it turns out there's this really beautiful group that was discovered by Bob Slog and Solitar, which has two generators and the, that has a single relation. Um, the, what you need to know for the purposes of the next three slides are that uh, this gives you a spin two chain, so not unreasonably large Hilbert space dimension. The, the dynamics that you would derive from this has is three local, which is also non offensive. And there's a conserved quantity, which is the number of these B, these B generators. Okay, so it has a UN conserved quantity and it's a reasonable model of dynamics. Okay. But it has hard, uh, a very hard word problem, and therefore the dynamics is very slow. So I'm going to illustrate that uh, as follows. Well. We're going to we're going to do some simulations on this kind of dynamics and some. They basically come from random unitary circuit type considerations, and we're going to initialize the system in a density wave of this conserved charge, and we're going to watch the density wave evolve. Okay. Uh, and then on the right, I'm going to plot the the fluctuations in the in the in the the density, the density of this conserved quantity. Okay. So then uh, here's what it looks like. And then it collapses. Okay. So two observations about this behavior. One observation is that if you look at the time at which this density collapses as a function of the wavelength of this density wave, uh, the relation is exponential. So the Time scale for this density wave is thermalized is an ex exponential function of its wavelength, which is uh, rather unusual in a system where you have no other <coughs> conservation loss. The other comment is that uh, we can just plot all the different uh, you know time steps of this this animation on the same plot, and you see that the density wave collapses in this kind of rather unusual way. It basically remains unchanged for a very long time until it kind of all of a sudden collapses at some sharp time scale. Okay. And in the thermodynamic limit, it turns out that this is a sharp behavior. So the density wave just like remains fixed for a time which is exponential on the system side, and then all of a sudden it, it disappears. Okay, so it's made, you may, some of you may recall this quote from Hemingway. Um, okay, so to summarize this rather formal section, the, the upshot is that we've created a system with local dynamics, which Provably retains an exponentially long memory of its initial conditions. Okay. And yeah, I think I think it's kind of interesting that this can occur in a very reasonable uh, physical model. And uh, yeah, that's basically the punchline of this part of the problem. So skip, 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 skip. And let me do the thing find collaborators and leave you for your the last uh, part of the school, then, yeah. um, uh, if you further enforce energy conservation, what does that do? Uh, yeah, I guess you have to decide on what you want your energy to look like. So, There's some local energy. Yeah, well, you have to tell me, like, do you, is your energy, uh, do you have give, like, large energy for, like, re repulsive energy between the, the particles of the I think it will depend on the details, but you can prove a theorem, which is that the, the time scale for the thermalization cannot be any faster than the time scale that I discussed here. So you can make it slower. I mean, obviously, you could choose your Hamiltonian to be some like many body localized Hamiltonian, even slower. But uh, the content of this talk is that there's a lower bound on the thermalization time, which is independent of the strategy. Adding energy conservation doesn't speed it up. No, it certainly yeah, doesn't. It shouldn't be changed. Yeah. So you mentioned that the, the, the more complex the, the, the computational problem is, the more uh, sparse the graph is. But, yes. but it seems that if, if the graph is highly connected, then to decide whether an edge is connected, it, it, it's also a very, very, very complex computational problem. Right? Yeah, you, don't really need to, you don't really need to, if you have high connectivity, you can just kind of like randomly choose 
So you, so you want to say like, uh, how, how do I get from one, one part of Hilbert space to another part of Hilbert space? Let's just randomly choose directions to go and you'll end up in the direction in, at any particular point you'll end up with. So as long as you have high connectivity, you're going to be fast. Uh, but you say in, in, in the decision problem, like the com the the in like in the com computer science sense, yeah, the yeah. computational com complexity yeah, of how to compute the graph, and it's not the complexity of of, of a particle from one side to move to the other. Side. It it basically is. So the 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 time that is needed for an algorithm to solve this problem is directly related to the diameter of the graph. So you know other properties about like how bottlenecks the graph is and other properties of its connectivity and its topology are can be important, but the the simplest way in which complexity theory enters is just determining the size of the, the diameter. Does it matter which group you choose when you build this model? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So if you so when you when you build this model, you want to choose a group where the problem of deciding you know, the, do these two strings represent the same group element is hard. So I actually find it quite kind of amazing that that problem is actually hard, right? Because all the groups we're used to thinking of, uh, that problem is very easy, right? So if I have like uh, the integers are complex, right? I, and I, I take up the multiplication product of all, all the generators, it's very easy. I just count up the number of ones and the number of minus ones. They have the zero that I need. You know? So in most groups that we are used to thinking of, especially as physicists, that this problem is actually very easy. Uh, so I think it's quite remarkable that there's just simple and easy to write down groups where the problem is actually very difficult. Um, but yeah, th those are not going to be things that we've ever heard of. So you have to go digging through this uh, ancient math stuff. How is it related to the way it works? Oh, I don't think I don't think it's related. It's uh, I, so the whole the whole point is to come up. We we want like the game we're playing here is we want as slow of thermalization as possible in a setting where we don't have disorder and we don't have energy and we want to be able to prove everything. So, I, yeah, I, I view it as a, a distinct way of just you getting to that matrix on the graph. You can ask for that. I can talk to yeah, okay. To that's a, some of the stuff that I skipped over at the end is kind of addressing going in that direction. I would love to talk about that. Yeah. Uh, Yes, thank you. So this is very naive, but um, I think, and even more so because I, I didn't really understand your your mapping from the yeah, um, from, from no, I mean it was a great talk, but your mapping from the um from this group to your uh, spatial distribution yeah. of the axis. But I I was struck by this this sudden uh, yeah. sudden relaxation and your statement that. In this simple system, it's provable that there's yeah. this exponential memory. Yeah. Um, do you see any connections to large language models? And, and obviously, you're trying to work in a place where things are provable and it's simple enough. But I'm just um, wondering if you <clears throat> want to um, think about a sudden change in behavior and something that has relatively local interactions, but still. Um, still effectively has a memory of its initial conditions. Yeah, I don't know about the connection with like phase transitions and large language models per se, but this phenomenon of this kind of dynamic transition, uh, some sharp transition like this that occurs at very long times, is I would say not very well understood. This kind of phenomenon goes under the, in the math literature is known as the cutoff phenomenon in Markov chains. Um, the simplest example where this happens is in card shuffling. So if you if you take like a deck of cards and you ask how many shuffles do I like, you, you take the distribution of cards and cards in the in the deck, and you ask what's the distance of that distribution away from the uniform distribution. That also has the phase transition where like at seven shuffles it becomes directly oh, compatible. Anyway, so there are some examples of this. I haven't understood any examples in physical models. Uh, other than card shuffling and this, so but it's a really cool phenomenon, right? So I would love to think about it more. But okay, in the context of large language model, that's not all right. Uh, more specialists. 
If not, oh yes, sorry, yes. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, you were considering, you know, where this, for instance, dipole symmetry is an exact symmetry. Right, yeah. Do you have examples where, you know, such a thing could emerge dynamically, like in an approximate way? So maybe it's still relevant or so. Uh, yeah, so in the, so there, there are two answers to that question. One is you can just imagine you have some model where you happen to have very large dipole conserving terms, and then you have small dipole violating terms, right? The dipole violating terms may or may not be irrelevant in the RG sense, depending on what phase of matter is right. Okay. Uh, the other realization is in these tilted optical lattices where dipole conservation is not an exact symmetry. It only becomes a symmetry in this like pre-thermal sense where you have some large energy scale, which is effectively preventing dipole violating processes from occurring. So it's emergent in some sense, but uh, in these examples, if you wait a long, long enough time, Sentinel, do you want to take? No, that's good. But there's also this example of the quantum Lipschitz transition. Where... Yeah. Okay. So, so the Lipschitz. So we, we we saw that you had this this Lipschitz model, which was describing this gold Einstein insulator phase, right? That, yeah. 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 So that we're familiar with seeing that that model occur at critical points. Uh, the, so you can be in situations where Corrections to that, which break dipole, that the symmetry are irrelevant. But that, that only occurs at critical points. Here, when you impose this symmetry, you can remove the, the need to work at a critical point. So you'll, you'll have this model describing a whole range of terms. All right. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, from the University of Massachusetts. Yeah. 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 All right, so thanks to the organizers for being together with the conference. Um, so, okay, my talk is going to be quite different, I think, from what all my talk is it better now yeah okay all right so yeah i was good saying that my talk is going to be quite different from many other talks at this workshop so it's also going to be about dynamics like ethan's talk uh but it will be a bit more quantum information flavored and we'll have to do also with measurements uh like simon's talk yesterday and so, you know, but hopefully I'll take a perspective that will appeal to people here and you can see this as a, you know, interesting distraction before lunch. Um, so, so yeah, I wanna tell you about something that we call learnability phase transitions and I'll explain what I mean. And it will occur from like a very basic question of ask, asking how much information you get from measuring or monitoring a quantum system. Okay. And I'll hopefully convince you that just thinking about this simple question leads you to interesting you know, phase transitions that are like different from maybe traditional quantum or thermal phase transition. So let me just thank my collaborators briefly. I've been working on this for a few years with various people. I'm not going to go through down the list. Uh, let me just highlight the junior people in particular. Many, most of the work I'm going to be talking about was done by Utkar Agwal, who was a grad student with me and is now postdoc at KITP. Okay. So let me motivate a little bit what the what this talk is going to be about. Um, so this is going to be a talk about quantum dynamics. Um, and the questions I'm going to be asking are going to be motivated by uh, the NISC era for yeah. noisy intermediate scale quantum devices and the fact that we have those analog or digital quantum simulators and processors. And for the purposes of this talk, uh, really the 
important point is like thinking about these devices will uh, kind of provide you like a general new perspective on thinking about dynamics. Um, so if you want to think about those devices, you know, they are noisy. So you have to think of an open quantum system of the environment. Um, but they also allow you to, uh, you know, monitor them and measure them. And the time scales for interactions and measurements are comparable. So you can actually have like, have them occur on the same time scales, uh, which means that in practice, like, you know, measuring your system is part of the dynamics. Okay. Um, so you kind of have to think of uh, dynamics in a general way where you have your system, but you're also measuring it and, you know, changing its state because it's quantum mechanics. Uh, and you can also, you know, maybe do something with those measurement outcomes and perform feedback on the system. Uh, so you kind of really actively, uh, you know, yeah, you have kind of an active process of quantum dynamics. So it's not just unitary dynamics. You kind of think of this whole cycle. Um, so one important point. So this talk, I'm mostly going to be talking about, uh, you know, measurements. So in some way, I'm, I'm going to be talking about open quantum systems. Um, one perhaps obvious point, but let me make it anyway, is it's, it's going to be very important to distinguish actually measuring a system or having some environment of the coherence. Um, okay. So, you know, when we measure a system, you just go back to quantum mechanics 101. Uh, you know, you say you have a bunch of qubits, you measure it, you get a bit strings of zeros and ones, and you will uh, project your wave function, right? And so I'll think of this uh, in the so-called quantum trajectory picture, where, you know, you have different outcomes and your wave function always remains pure. And you project it, of course, it's not normalized in the way I wrote it, and the norm is the so-called born probability with which you get this measurement outcome. So in contrast, if you have, say, some environment and you imagine, you know, that this, maybe the environment is measuring your system in some way, right? Um, you know, it can be true, but like the important point is like, if you have an environment by definition, you don't have access to whatever those measurements were and what the measurement outcomes are, right? So what it means formally is like, whatever you have access is like in this, you know, mixed states, you know, from this average density matrix. So if you deal with like, you know, Lindblad equation or you write like a quantum channel for open quantum system, you'll typically work with this object, okay? And so in this talk, and this was a lesson from recent years that there is non-trivial physics thinking about those trajectories that is not visible at the level of like uh, averaging like that, okay? Uh, so in a nutshell, the physics I'm gonna be talking about really relies on measurements and not just coupling to some environments. So decoherence is not gonna do it. So what kind of new physics? Well, I, I will hopefully convince you that you can have new phase transitions just thinking about the systems. Um, so this is related to the field of measurement-induced uh, phase transitions. So I assume that you know, most people here have heard of at some point. Um, but so in this talk, I'll try to provide a maybe more physical perspective on these, um, trying to think of uh, information and how much you learn from the measurements. Um, so here's a cartoon and I'll make this more precise. Um, so the typical setup I'll have in mind is, you know, you have like, typical quantum info setup, we have Alice and Bob, and Alice is trying to transmit some quantum information to Bob. Uh, and so to do that, she encodes some information in a system and, you know, it undergoes some kind of quantum dynamics. And whatever, the, you know, there's no error here, or the errors will come from having a third party that I'm going to call Eve. It's like measuring the system. Okay. And the basic question that we're gonna ask is whether Eve can actually get any information from those measurements, okay? Um, so this is gonna be asking something rather fundamental, I would argue, of just like, say you have a many-body quantum system, you measure it in some way, do you actually learn anything, okay? And you'll see that just answering that question is actually non-trivial. And there's actually different phases of whether you learn or not, okay? And it's related to so-called coding transition of whether Bob can also recover the message or not, okay? Um, I, I won't talk really about this today, but let me briefly mention that this is, there's a related class of transitions that are known as complexity transitions, which occur when you start thinking about the complexity of subtasks. So you'll, you'll notice this is very different from, again, the traditional, you know, thermal or quantum phase transitions we all think about, right? 
So here, like you're thinking of like, I don't know, you have a tensor network, you're a numerical person, and you ask how hard is it, you know, in a complexity sense to actually compute, contract that tensor network, okay? Uh, or how hard is it to simulate a given quantum circuit, okay? And it turns out that, again, answering those questions is not a just binary yes or no answer, but there's actually also phase transitions, and you can use some of the language of condensed matter to answer them, okay? So again, my perspective is going to be very different from say Simon's yesterday. I'm going to be mostly using tools of you know statistical physics and condensed matter to try to answer those questions. Okay, so those things look very unrelated, but you know they are. And so if you're interested, you can ask me. I won't talk about complexity here. Okay, so if that all sounded like quantum information mumbo jumbo, the, the rest of this talk is going to be trying to give you just a very concrete like example uh, of what I mean. Okay. Uh, that will be in some way almost a bit classical and will be like maybe more in So, okay. So the question I'm going to ask is whether you can learn a global chart of a system from making local measurements. Okay. So what do I mean by this? Let me consider a 1D for simplicity. It could be in any dimension. Many body quantum system with a conserve charge. Okay. It could be anything you want. Fermion, bosons, whatever. Um, and you know, take a whatever Hubbard model. You just don't want it to be integrable. So not fine-tuned, not free fermions. Okay. Um, and okay, then you prepare your system in some initial states, and that initial state could have like two different charges. Okay, so I'm going to denote two different initial states, Q0 and Q1, that are in different charge sectors. So say Q0 could be at half filling, and Q1 is maybe half filling plus one particle. Yeah. Okay. You know, and then you'll have some dynamics. So, you know, I, I throughout this talk, I'll be drawing a lot of quantum circuits where I'm going to think that I have qubits and I have gates. Again, if you don't like quantum circuits, that's fine. The same physics works with Hamiltonians. So again, pick your favorite model with charge conservation. I just want a U1 conserved quantity. Think of a Hamiltonian dynamics. Um, you know, and you have two initial states. Again, the only difference is to have two different charge sectors. Okay, and during that dynamics, you're going to be measuring your system. Okay, so you have like Eve, uh, who's like eavesdropping or measuring the system, uh, making local measurements of charge. Okay, and Eve, the question I'm going to ask is whether Eve can just determine which charge sector it is. Okay, so of course, the thing you can do is you could just measure the whole wave function. Obviously, that will just tell you where the charge is. Okay. That's no fun. So like the, the way I'm going to do it is imagine that Eve can do this only in a partial way. So either through weak measurements or like, so in the context of think of it of discrete time quantum dynamics, right? So I have gates, they preserve this charge. And so I will allow Eve to make local measurements. So locally on each qubit or site, I will measure the charge and with some rate I'm going to call P. Okay. So it could be Hamiltonian dynamics and weak measurements. So it could be in the context of that quantum circuit, P would be the probability you measure each qubit after each layer of gates. Okay, so with probability P, you measure this one. So you say you measure here, you don't find a charge, measure here, you find a charge. Okay. All right. And now Eve's goal, so you do this for a time scale of order L. L is in number of qubits. And the question is, is that information enough to tell you which initial state it was? Okay. So it's a well-defined problem. I hope you'll all agree, right? It's pretty simple. I'm just asking you have this partial information, space time, you know, snapshots of what the charges are. Is that enough to tell you whether you had half filling or half filling plus one particle? Okay. So I claim that like answering that question as simple and trivial as it looks is actually leads to like, there's actually a phase transition, like an actual threshold in answering that question. Okay. There's the answer there's going to be an actual threshold that I'm going to call P sharp, uh, determining whether Eve can actually do this accurately. Yeah. Okay. Does that does the setup make sense? Because I'm going to be using this quite a lot. So maybe if there's questions about this, we can. All right. So, yeah. So pretty simple. Can you get the global chart of a system, you know, uh, fr from those local measurements? So, okay, this is just uh, one slide for like the models that we consider. Like again, the, the physics that I'm going to talk about is very universal. 
right? So, so it's universal in the same like stat makes sense. Again, it doesn't really depend on the model and so on. But the model that we study will be a quantum circuit where you know I have gates, they have a block diagonal structure to preserve like a U1 conserved quantity. And on top of that, I have projective measurements in blue with some rates where I measure the, I measure the, the charge, right? And so there are various you know, reasons to think about this where you have this like symmetry, but again, like here I'm gonna be focusing purely on how much information about charge can you extract from local measurements. So, so if you didn't do any measurements, then the charge would be conserved in the circuit? Yeah, the charge is still conserved yeah. because I'm measuring I'm measuring charge, right? So so charge is conserved no matter what. Um, I'm yeah, charge is just diffusing, right? So so I have a U one conserved quantity, well, just diffuse. Okay. Uh, so how I define charge with qubit? Yeah, so like uh, qubit, you know, just total Z conservation, right? Like it's yeah. I ju I just say I have a U one. The charge is what the charge is is Z or. Yeah, Z, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I, I mean just you know, zero, no charge, one charge. Yeah. So Z conservation. The, the kind of Isaac model that you look at photo uh, and you measure is it local S Z and... just measure local S Z, exactly. You want to include yeah. what, what is the and I want to know the total nah. charge of the system. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Sorry. The, yeah. the legs of these green things are connected in a particular pattern in, in, in this drawing. Is that yeah. Yeah, so different? so there's a brick wall pattern. So basically, that just gives you like local interactions, right? So so here, like you have those two qubits interact, and these two qubits interact. This is time. This is space. Uh, you can think of it as a authorized version of a Hamiltonian evolution, if you want, right? Like like I said, it, yeah. In a sense, you want probably to avoid some trivial cases where these things are not talking to each other. Then yeah. of course you will not learn, right? So that's yeah. why you. No, I, I want like some you know completely yeah. chaotic dynamics, and yeah, absolutely. Yeah. As an example, I mean, I, I know it's very general and yeah. uh, works for everything, but if I think of just transverse sizing when uh, okay. these boxes are Z, 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 and then X. So, so I, I want a U1 conserved quantity. A U1. Okay. Yeah, so, I, I want U1. Yeah. I, I can talk about Z2 later if you want, but, but U1 for okay, people. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Um, okay. So let's just think about it a bit physically, right? So how many local charge measurements do you need to estimate the charge of a system, right? Uh, let's do something dumb first. Like, let's imagine those measurements are very sparse and like essentially independent from each other, right? Let's say you're just like measuring independent local charge information. Okay? If I give you a bunch of like local charge measurement and I ask you to estimate the filling, the most natural thing you can do is just average. Right, so you, so you had 50, you know, you measure 100 times, you find 50 times a charge, 50 times no charge, maybe you had half inning, right? Um, okay, this is of course true if the measurements are independent, right? That's actually the best you can do. Um, how many measurements do you need to resolve the charge? Well, this is just basically central limit theorem, right? So let's say you want to distinguish half filling and half filling plus one particle. You need to resolve charge density by a factor one over L. Hence, you need L squared measurements, okay? So this is a lower estimate, right? Because the measurements are actually highly correlated and that's what makes this problem interesting, right? So the measurements are very much not independent, which means you can actually do a lot better. This is the worst possible thing you can do short of flipping a coin, right? Okay, worst thing you can do is flip a coin and just like, don't do any physics. This is the you know, next step, uh, but I claim you can actually do better. All right, so this is uh, kind of the main result and I will tell you a little bit about how we know this. Uh, and so this is an example of, again, what I call learnability phase transitions. Um, so answering that question, again, there's a phase diagram, okay? There's, there's an actual phase diagram as a function of this measurement rate, which here I call P, and you can think of it again as the ratio of measurement over your interaction strength in your system or something, right? Like it's. Uh, so this is, like I said, universal, and you actually have different phases, and phases in the sense of like how to answer that question, right? So th there's a phase, if you don't measure much, there's a phase that we call charge fuzzy, where like if, if you started with a quantum superposition of different charge sectors, the measurements will not be able to fully collapse the wave function on a given charge sectors. And, and that, and Eve here will, um, you know, we'll not be able to really distinguish states, at least accurately. Uh, but I claim there's a threshold 
uh, again, P sharp, where here, like the measurements will actually collapse the charge and in the thermodynamic limits, you know, there's an actual phase transition uh, here. Like basically you can just, you will be able to tell which state it is with accuracy 100%. Okay, so, so that's, that's it's, it is a sharp statement. Um, you'll notice I have another threshold over there. I won't talk too much about this, uh, but basically what happens beyond that threshold is you start learning stuff beyond charge. Okay, so meaning that here, Eve will be able to be able to distinguish states that are within the same charge sector, for example. Okay, so all those transitions, like they have to do with again how much you extract from the measurements. The intuition that you should have is like you know charge is something easy. It's easier to distinguish states that have a global label, right? That states that are within a given charge sector. Those are harder to distinguish, so you need to measure more. You have a different threshold here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so let me just emphasize that this is an actual phase transition, right? Uh, this is a sharp phase transition. It has, you know, you can define coalition functions uh, within a trajectory. So those are like, for example, equal time coalition functions in the steady states of those systems, <clears throat> average of the trajectories. So again, this is kind of a unusual quantity because of that nonlinear term here. Uh, when you average over trajectories, like if you look at those correlations, they, they actually look like a, you know, maybe typical phase transition that uh, we know and love. Uh, so for example, like this phase look like, looks like a Luttinger liquid in many ways, uh, whereas that phase looks like a gapped phase. Uh, so uh, you could actually construct correlation functions of that kind, uh, and you can define time scales again, like, you know, quantum here in that phase, quantum superposition of charges will persist up to time scale of order L, whereas here they'll collapse a lot faster. Okay, so. Uh, no, that's because you're projecting dynamics that you basically yeah so that's what the measurements will do right that they'll collapse your wave function right like you just do it partially and and so it will take a different time or different number of measurements for your yeah yeah so in the liquid state right, uh, you have a clean uh liquid state uh, yeah we talk about uh things like due to weight yeah in uh in equilibrium systems yeah is there something you can define similarly to characterize this how uh, how how conducting Mm -hmm. that is. Um, there is something like a super fluid stiff stiffness, which is the closest thing I can, you know, uh, to related to a question. So, so yeah, that, like this transition is actually a lot like a super fluid to mud based transition. So again, I was I mentioned that we could use tools from condensed matter. This is where you know. Uh, so so yeah, like th there is something that's there's some effective super fluid yeah. stiffness here, which depends on the measurement rates of your system. But again, it, you have to you know this is in a yeah different. You know, like the way to observe this phase is not by just measuring something like a specific heat or anything like this. You have to ask either non-trivial questions about the trajectories or ask about like, again, answering that question of how much do you learn from your measurement outcomes? So it's fairly non-trivial to actually access those, those correlations. Uh, okay. um, all right, in, in the time I have left, let me actually tell you how we know this. This is just like one slide to convince you I'm not making this up. Um, so, so how, how do we know this? Well, um, yeah, we've, over the years, we've developed like uh, a lot of formalism to actually understand the systems and those transitions analytically. Um, so this is just for, mostly for theorists, it's just like a few, okay. If you wanna know more about this, you can ask me afterwards, but uh, essentially you have to realize the measurement process is nonlinear, right? Uh, and so because of this, we have to deal with this nonlinearity. And the way we do this is using a replica trick. We take like copies of a system. If you want, you should think of it as a disordered system in some way. Okay. Um, once we deal with this disordered system, like averaging over like different gates, for example, or measurement outcomes gives us a statmec model. And from there, we can use standard tools. Okay. So this is very schematic. It's just to like... Uh, but I claim that like, if you think seriously of those circuits with like, where we take the gates to be random and with some symmetries and take the measurements and we, we can end up with like tractable classical stat make models. And so that's something we've been working on for many years and now it's become relatively standard in this field. Yes. Are the effective field theories you get qualitatively different from standard ones. So for instance, when you do the replica trick, you get, you know, non-local and imaginary time. Good. Uh, yeah. Field theory. So are these, do these have like also some kind of features that are unique? in that sense? Thanks, yeah. Um, yes and no. So like over the years, the people have realized a lot of 
many of those transitions are, for example, related to, so if you do this for free fermions, for example, it's closely related to like, you know, Anderson transitions and Sigma models on like, yes, you know, uh, many people are working on this. Uh, so there are analogies and similarities for sure. Uh, there's some structure that's a bit specific here. So you have some replica structure. There's like some, like for example, like in that U1 problem, this, there's a part of the field theory that will just describe diffusion because you know I have a U1 charge, so I'll, I'll, I'll have diffusion. And that part is kind of trivial, meaning it doesn't require trajectories or whatever. And there's some stuff coupling the replicas that will come from the measurements. So there's some special structure that distinguishes, you know, what observables are kind of linear in the density matrix and will be something you observe if you throw away the measurements and part that where well, you need the measurements basically. But yeah. Um, can, you say, yeah. can you say something about uh, post selection? You yeah, so the perspective I'm going to have is that I don't need post-selection because I'll be thinking about answering that question of, uh, you know, do you extract information or not, right? So, so let me just say, okay, let me answer your question a bit more. So if you wanted to measure this naively in an experiment, you will have to post-select, okay? So that's bad. I'm not going to do that. However, notice the perspective that I ask is a bit different, right? I ask whether Eve can recover the charge. And so the way I'm going to detect the transition in the physics is actually trying to do this in practice. You know, I'm going to try to recover the charge, and if I can, you know, I'll be in one phase, and if I can't, I'll be in the other phase. Does that make sense? Do it without post-selection. Yeah, so there's no post-selection here. Uh, but the trade-off is there's, you know, I have to come up with a good algorithm to do this. And that's maybe the last point I was going to mention. Yeah. So you need a certain number of measurements to find charges of nature. Is that what you're saying? Or What's that? Yeah. So you need a certain number of measurements uh, to find charge with certain accuracy. Exactly. Yeah. And this uh, number uh, scales in a certain way. As a function of measurement rate, it changes abruptly. Right. And it's different for two phases. Yeah. Uh, it's... So in one phase, it's you need L squared measurement. That's basically the central limit argument. And in the other phase, you need L times log L. Some log L. Yeah. So you have like a distinct. Yeah, exactly. So that's basically the, the transition that you're talking Exactly. About. Yeah. So, so there's, there's a sharp behavior that you can get from that field theory. Okay. So here, like the only thing, you know, you, only point I'm making here is that, you know, I'm not making it up. We can understand all of this seriously. Uh, and, uh, you know, we can use standard tools. We can do RG field theories. Uh, we have a field theory for that transition. And the transition is driven by defects that have some replica structure, you know. Uh, but that part in some way is not the most exciting part. I mean, that's standard statistical physics or condensed matter, right? And which is nice and so on, but we apply it to this. So now maybe like going back to Leo's question. Um, so you'll notice that I, you know, I told you there's this threshold of where Eve can actually learn the charge, but I didn't tell you how to actually get the charge. So, so that is where the subtlety enters. So basically there's an optimal threshold. Uh, and you know, if we actually want to be Eve, and say I have an experiment and I'll show you experimental data where we do this and you know, we have this snapshot, we measure there was no charge here, spin down here, spin up here. You know, if I'm Eve, how do I guess what the charge is, right? Um, I, what I told you so far is Eve should be able to do this like probably above a threshold. Uh, the caveat that I omitted is like, this is kind of an optimal bound, okay? Uh, so it's like if with unlimited resources, and if you're curious about what I mean here, you can ask me after, but you know, really mean like you have access to like a quantum computer with post selection on it. Uh, so it's pretty bad in terms of resources. Uh, there's this threshold. Okay? Um, and a practical question, of course, is how do you do this in practice, right? So I don't want unlimited resources. Like how do, can I do this efficiently and in a scalable way uh, you know, with like a classical computer? So, and this is where I will like wrap up my talk. I will just tell you briefly about what we've been doing and, you know, the community has been doing as a whole, uh, trying to come up with good, uh, you know, we call them classifiers or decoders, where you take that information and you actually try to be Eve and try to guess what the charge is, okay? Um, there are various things that you can do. So, for example, you can try to forget quantum mechanics. What I mean by this is let's imagine Eve, like, you know, you have those gates, and let's say you don't know, you know, what those gates are and you marginalize over them. Then like the best thing you can do is kind of say that, you know, those things are on average, maybe with probability one half, the particle will hop to the right. You know, you, you have like just a classical process of your charges moving around. Um, and 
you know, it's kind of a dumb thing to do. You throw away all the quantum mechanics, so you map it to something classical. But, but still, that classical problem is non-trivial. So ignore that formula. Uh, but the important point is, yeah, so if you don't have knowledge of the circuit, that is, if you marginalize over whatever the gates you have, it ends up being a classical problem, which is still non-trivial. It's basically counting random walks that are compatible with those measurement outcomes. And that, you know, we can, this is actually what the field theory is about as well. Like it's, it's about this classical system. Um, and we can do also efficiently numerically. Okay. Um, this is just like one plot of what it looks like in practice. Uh, services, measurement rates, accuracy. So like how accurate Eve is. So you see at low measurement rate, you start at one half, you flip a coin, right? But as you measure more, like Eve is able to do better and better. Those are different system sizes. Okay. And of course, if you measure enough, basically you get it right. Like, okay. Uh, the dash line is the naive estimate where you just average your measurement outcomes. This is what you do if you count those random walks. So you do this in a smarter way. Um, and, you know, those are different system sizes. It is an actual phase transition here as well. So, you know, you have this uh, pattern that is always, so this we can do in a scalable way. And there's also a phase transition and a threshold associated with it. So this is system size and what's the... Yeah, those are different. I forgot what the system size are. We can do this classically. So we can do this to like, I don't know, 100 sites or something. Uh, so those are actually relatively small. I think they're like between 20 and 30 sites. Okay. Okay. But the transition there is where is it really is not analytically touching the the one. Yeah, so so the, the caveat is like there's a transition there, but it's not exactly the transition I told you about. It's shifted a little bit. And this is actually typical in like those coding or decoding phase transition. There's like an optimal threshold, and then you have different decoders, and they may have different thresholds as well. And so this is similar in that sense. However, from the stat make point of view, this has the same universality class as that one, and you can get it very close. It's so it's decoder dependent pieces. So. Yeah, that that's right. But the universality properties are like, you know. All right, so I think I'm out of time. Let me just mention that we've been playing with this, you know, also like in actual quantum hardware where you precisely do this. There's some caveats, you know, you have to deal with noise mitigation and we're doing weak measurements there. But you pretty much do this exactly in practice. Like you just have different initial states with different charge you measure and you want to tell like what charge you have. Okay, and so for this, you need an actual algorithm when you need like a decoder, as you were saying. So we've been comparing like different decoders. Some are like scalable, some not. Uh, you know, you can do something dumb like neural network and try to train it to, you know, get the charge or not and, and try to see if that, you know, gets you there in an analytical way. Okay, so let me just wrap up. Uh, really, the only message you should get is like, yeah, answering that simple question of how much do you learn from measurements actually is pretty non trivial and needs you to like non trivial phase transitions. Um, I only sketched this, but like, there's a lot of room for like statistical physics and condensed matter tools to be applied to those systems. And that's pretty much, you know, what I work on in that field. Uh, there's a lot of open questions. Let me also mention like, there's a very nice paper by Matteo Ippoliti and Verica Kemani that came out just a couple of months ago on a related topic where they have like a, you know, also broader picture on this. So yeah, thank you for your attention. Is there something like heating by the measurement in trauma? You mentioned it is a steady state thing. So yeah, thanks. Yeah, I actually Matt was asking me about this earlier. Um, yeah, um, like it's, so, you know, in the models I, I talked about, there is, but it doesn't really matter uh, because my, my dynamic, even without the measurements, I'm I'm doing a I, I'm doing a random circuit, right? So I, I don't have any conservation law except U1. So I will thermalize to infinite temperature no matter what. Like if even if you remove the measurements, you'll heat up to infinite temperature. But at least in the StatMec model that I'm doing, it, it doesn't matter. We are actually discussing with Matt that in other contexts it might. Um, so it, it's yeah. Like we need a bounded spectrum. I have a bounded spectrum. Yeah, that's right. I, I have like bounded on site Hilbert space. I, I didn't say that, but that, that part is actually important. Yeah, I I do have bounded Hilbert space and I didn't put, you know, I don't expect energy. I didn't have energy conservation in what I did. Right? So I had like random gates. So, yeah. Yes.
Maybe you said this, and I, I missed it. Do you, do you do you have the same kind of transition in the in the, in the classical version of this process? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, so so there's a formal way to think about it, which is kind of like a large n way. Um, if you want, like so so we can take like this model I told you about, where we have charge on site, and we can put neutral degrees of freedom, like things that don't have u one, right? Like we can put a q det on it yes. that's coupled, and we if we take that. The, the dimension of that Q did to go to infinity that basically defaces everything and gives you a classical model. Yeah. Um, and then we can do one of the D corrections. So, so that is the analog of large N in that field, basically. So, so in the D goes to infinity, you still have a sharp. That, that's right, yeah. And that's actually like the, the classical decoder transition I told you about, that they collapse in the, yeah. So, so this is like, again, yeah. So, so you basically have like the same universality class, like here the one of the D or one of the N corrections are not relevant. Uh, but you shift the transition a bit. Yeah. yeah. So I'm curious about the transition between a Lottinger liquid like this and some gapped phase. Yeah. So usually a Lottinger liquid phase, if you ask what the uh, correlation function or what's the scaling dimension of that, usually it depends on the Lottinger parameters as well. But yeah. here, uh, as far as I understand, this query, the, the scaling dimension is a fixed number. Yeah, I mean, th th that would be the same in a Luttinger liquid, though, right? If you take a charge charge correlation, it would also be 1 over R squared. Uh, but if you're asking, can we get correlation functions with continuously varying exponents? Yes, we can. I'm just not showing them here. You can construct like a string order parameter, you know, like, like a Jordan Wigner type thing, like a, a yeah, you can construct string operators where they would have like, you would probe the superfluid density of this. And, and so that would be continuously varying. Okay, so, but in any case, this does not depend on P, right? Doesn't depend on what? Uh, on P, no. No, but again, it would be the same in the Luttinger liquid, right? If you take a Luttinger liquid, charge charge correlations on just one over X squared, right? Yeah. Just a question. Yes, it does. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So, so in those continuously varying exponents, they depend on P, correct? Yeah. So, then is P star just Cosserell style or something else? Yep. Uh, yeah, yeah, like as you might guess, you know, sure, yeah, of course. What else could it be? Yeah, just, just, <laughs> yeah so it is Cosserell style. There's also like, a, there's just a subtlety, like the, the vortices are like, they have some replica structure. So, you have like bound like vortex, anti vortex in different replicas. There's just, you know, marginal differences in like the thresholds and so on. So there's a little bit of decoration because of the replica structure, but otherwise, yeah. Like the field theory is basically a bunch of like, the measurements give you like relativistic goals. You start from diffusion, but once you put the measurements, you have some gap mode. If you integrate them out, you'll get relativistic goals modes. And then, yeah, you just think about, you know, topological defects for these, yeah. So just following up on this infinite temperature. Yeah. So how does it make sense to talk about lattice correlations if you anyway heat up to infinite temperature? Great. Don't yeah. you default to classical diffusion? Of no, but the, so so that's the yeah. So so sorry. So that's a very important point. Thank you. I, and that's the beauty of it, right? So so here, like I said, I have a Luttinger liquid, but you have to be very careful. It's in those trajectories. So of course, I don't have low temperature here. I, I don't even have a temperature. I don't have a Hamiltonian. So this is defined by take your quantum trajectory psi m you know, projected like your wave function, like, you know, with labeled by M, okay? And then you measure charge charge correlation equal time in that trajectory. And at the end, you average over those trajectories. This is a weird observable, right? And it's weird because of that second term, because that is nonlinear in your density matrix, right? So, so that's not something you would get in a Limblad equation, for example, right? So, so that's like, there that was a subtlety I was highlighting originally. We can maybe, I can explain this more offline, right? But yeah, so, so the claim is like, if you look at the physics in those trajectories, it looks like a low temperature, you know, zero temperature Luttinger liquid, but it's very much the system. If you look at correlation functions, like the average density matrix is just identity. So, so just to be clear, like the, yeah, what I call row bar is, yeah, never mind. The, the row bar is just infinite temperature. So if you look at any correlation function in that is just trivial, but that, Thing here is not expressible in terms of row bar. Yeah. 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 Just two questions. One is, can you just clarify? Uh, yes, I mean, so, so it's the natural part is this is the fact that it's a connected correlator before you average. 
Yeah, the non-trivial part is the disconnected piece, actually. And, yeah. And you're averaging over different sets of outcomes, of yeah. charge outcomes. Correct. Yeah. So so you get like you you get some measurement outcomes. That's what I call the trajectories, okay. right? I have those zeros in one. I take that wave function, I just measure equal time correlation <laughs> functions in it. And then at the end of the day, I average over those possible things. But of course, this is where your post-selection question would enter, right? If you try to do this in an experiment, of course, you would have trouble because of that second piece, right? Because it, you know, you would need to prepare your system many times in the same trajectory to do this. And the second question, yeah. just a clarifying, can you show that Lagrangian again? I, I don't understand all the symbols. In yeah, I, I, I didn't. Why is it crazy? So, yeah. so what? I, I, I didn't explain what? that. Yeah, so, so this was just to, you know, again, uh, cartoon picture. But if you want to know the detail, yeah. So well, there's, there's some what details. I want the schematic. Please. So the schematic is there's a replica average mode. That's what we call phi, phi bar. So this is average and symmetric over the replicas. And this is like the pi pi is like the inter replica thing. So you have like, if you want, you, you have some replica symmetric mode and some things that couple the replicas. The replica symmetric stuff, this is the action of a z equals two ferromagnet. This is just diffusion. Uh, and that part is just like the relativistic Goldston modes I was talking about that's that come from the measurements. And that's the part that will give you the physics I told you about. Yeah. So how does the first uh, sector enter into? So the first sector is just describing charge diffusion. And that part is there in row bar, actually, right? It's, it's there in the average dynamics. So if they, 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 yeah, so thanks. That's a very good question. So in general, they do. In higher dimension, they will. But there's a, they interact only via like irrelevant terms in 1D. So we're lucky. So that yeah. first piece doesn't affect the the, the claim about the Lange liquid versus the modern. That's liquid. right. Yeah. So so in 1D, there's some decoupling of this. In higher dimension, it would be like a you know x y magnet coupled to a z equals two diffusing thing. And nice. so we, we're a bit you know I expect it will have a different z even and so on in higher dimension. Thank you. Yeah. Right. More questions. Not in lunch, but first let's spend probably.